<laughs> Maybe 20. <laughs> All right, we're going to start in just a second. Uh, Chumps with Telemedia. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Chumps with Conservation Commission meeting. My name is Carl Bischoff. I'm the chair of the Conservation Commission. Um, we're going to get started with a number of items on our list. The first thing um, uh, on our agenda item is open citizen concerns that are not on our agenda. So if, it, if you know that it's on the agenda, save, save it till uh, later on our, in our agenda. But if there's something that you'd like to bring to our attention that's not on the agenda, we're open for any, anything you want to bring up. Online. Yeah. yeah, I got one little thing. Vivian. I got, I got another taping on City Life Thursday. You have any messages that you want to share with the world? <sighs> uh, <laughs> top of my head, no. Uh, but maybe if we have something, we'll let you know. Thanks. Okay, so the first thing on our agenda um, <coughs> under here is that we did have a meeting uh, about on August 31st, which was um, uh, an in-town meeting, and I'm sharing this with my fellow commission members. Um, this came up after our last meeting in, uh, in August. Uh, there was a meeting with the Conservation Commission, two of us, Peter and I, uh, a couple of members of the Planning Board, a uh, member from the Board of Health, three Chelmsford Water Districts, uh, Evan Belansky, David Kuntz, uh, Mr. Uh, Paul Cohen, and Paul Haverty, the Town Council. Uh, the purpose of that meeting was really, um, it became evident to many of us that um, there were Im issues impacting water quality and protection of water quality here in Chelmsford. And there are many entities here in town that have, have a stake in that, conservation, planning board, board of health, uh, the water districts. And so what was becoming clear with some of the bigger projects that were happening in town was that we weren't coordinated, we weren't aligned, um, we had information that was not available to everybody. Um, and so the idea was to increase that communication around those issues, um, get everybody together in a room and just kind of talk through how we can improve that process. Um, we wanted to ask the water districts to identify how they how they work when there is a new project in town inside the um, the water protection area, um, how they review the projects that are in there and have us better understand that. Um, it was clear that we all have the same uh, common interest, but we have different perspectives from our different different uh, parts of town. It was a really good uh, it was a really good meeting. Evan uh, Belansky gets the credit for setting that up. It was. Uh, great to have that happen. Um, we did identify some gaps. Um, we identified opportunities to share information across the different groups, um, some better use of some of the tools and bylaws that are in town. We did identify that the water district has uh, a really well done groundwater protection SOP in place that they're uh, getting ready to roll out. Um, it's still in process, I think, uh, but it's getting bet It's getting close to being rolled out, and it seems to be quite good. Um, the Board of Health also, maybe not known to all of us, had a groundwater protection uh, zone regulation, 201, Article 7, which gives them the ability to request a groundwater uh, environmental impact report, which could include a geohydrology report. Um, it was good to know that they have that capability, so we are more, all of us are more aware that that's there. Um, we're going to have a follow-up meeting with the same group. If anybody else on the board is interested in participating, let us know. We can try to get you involved. The date hasn't been set. Um, there's a number of other action items. I, I, I've made, uh, Peter really put the minutes together. I went through and, and um, uh, a couple of tweaks on it, but um, it was really Peter's doing, and um, so we're uh, I shared that with each of you um, so you can have that and I'm asking Vivian if you can include that in our um, addendum to our minutes for this meeting is that something we yeah. can do yeah, okay absolutely. thank you so we can we'll have a record of that um, so any any comments or any 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 reaction or thoughts or 
Anything else you want to add, Peter? Um, I think you covered it pretty well. I think the another another way to look at at the, how the town handles drinking water quality is the <coughs> responsibility for making sure our water is clean is spread around a number of different boards and 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 departments and districts. And um, so the idea was because the the regulatory authority is kind of spread around what four or five six different groups in town. Um, we're very excited that everyone agreed it makes sense to increase that collaboration and, and pay a little bit of extra attention to keeping the groundwater uh, in town as clean as possible. So. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, anything else? Dave? It's amazing to me that this meeting had to occur in the first place. Two organizations, water and Board of Health, I guess, are unaware of what conservation's responsibilities are, and I suspect conservation is somewhat ignorant as to what their response, their what uh, Water Department and Board of Health's responsibilities are. Conservation Commission's been in existence since 1960, and one of our purposes is to protect the wetlands and water resources of the town. But I can't remember the last time the Water Department or the Board of Health notified the Conservation Commission of a problem and how they were addressing it and just letting us know that there was an issue that needed to be worked on. If that can happen, that's a significant improvement. Just that in itself. What's going to be interesting is to see how these various parties are organized to initiate actions and activities. We got, I, let's, let's hope it works. We've tried it before, vaguely. Planning Board and Conservation tried to work together 15, 20 years ago and didn't work. So maybe it will this time. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Uh, next on the agenda, Chris Lavalley. Um, you, you have a question on <coughs> open? Yeah. This, there are three. All three were there: Chelmsford Water District, North Water District, and East Water District. And all three, all three were there. Sure all three were there. Yep, Chris, um, you're next on the agenda for. Uh, thanks for that question, uh, Chris. Just so Chris is our liaison with the Planning Board. Chris is a member of the Planning <laughs> Board, and um, he's going to give a short update on liaison issues. And Chris was part of that meeting as well. Yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, that was a good first meeting. Um, I consider that a first step towards a lot more cooperation and collaboration between those various groups. Um, I think our two boards have already started with that, uh, and so I, I hope that that does continue. Um, pretty much no updates um, uh, other than a couple Announcements went out um, related to the um, the MBTA zoning uh, public hearings, specifically for uh, Riverneck and um, the UPS site on either the 19th or the 21st. I forget which one's which. And then the um, Radisson site, and then the blank. I forget which one it is now, um, but that one's on the 21st. Um, so the notices have gone out. The public uh, uh, notices are posted. Um, we'll be having more information at our planning board meeting tomorrow night, uh, setting the agenda for those meetings. <coughs> so if your board does want to participate, we're more than happy to have you provide some input as well on those sites. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that we've got our meeting tomorrow night, so two of the uh, agenda items that you guys have on here are also before the board uh, tomorrow night. Um, the Hildreth and, um, oh, I guess it's just Hildreth. Um, so the, that one is also on the agenda for tomorrow night. Okay. Uh, we also do have another project. Um, I thought it was on your agenda, but I guess not. Bill Rick, uh, Brick Hill Road. 
um, for uh, a potential warehouse up there. That, that's on the agenda for September 26th. Okay, so we're hearing that one before you guys. Okay, <laughs> that's actually good to know. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Thank you very much. Can we ask Chris a couple questions? Hey, Chris, yeah. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Dave. Yeah. Do we know how many housing units we have to contribute for the MBTA project? Not yes. Ne not necessarily where, but just how many, and is it a function of the size of Chelmsford? No. Um, it's a density requirement and an acreage requirement. Um, so it's a minimum of 15 units per acre. Um, so what we're trying to do is, I think we have to have a minimum of 50 acres. Um, and so we're targeting a little bit more so that we can spread that density out a little bit more. Um, and be able to um, set the zoning to allow specific form functions. Um, we are restricted by the state into uh, how much we can restrict the uh, zoning in those areas once we do. So in that sense, there's a limit on how, there many, is some how, limits. how many units you can have. Yeah. Because that would limit it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Why not the coolest property? Where is that one? Pine Hill Road, 35 acres. So we looked at a number of different sites, um, and there are minimum requirements from the state in terms of contiguous number of lots, how many lots can be included. Um, you can't spot zone specific lots. Distance uh, to an MBTA stop, too? Is that a limitation? No, not, for, not necessarily for the um, adjacent communities. For the MBTA specific communities, there are restrictions there, um, but for the adjacent communities, it's a little bit so less you, clear. Theoretically, you could have one on the other side of Chelmsford, even though yeah. we're talking about yeah, we've Lowell Station. What we've done is we've looked at a number of different sites, asked um, NEMCOG to take a look to see if it meets the minimum requirements for area, for uh, location. Uh, there are also minimum requirements for buildable area on the lot, so if it's too much wetlands, it's not going to work. Um, and so they came back with um, a, a shorter list of sites that actually do meet the requirements. And then those are all possible sites that we can look at in terms of their characteristics, if it makes sense to put MBTA zoning there or not, and then look at um, different uh, configurations and different combinations of the sites to get the total uh, requirements that we need to meet. Thanks. And so the neighborhood meetings are we're not set on the, any of these areas, um, but we're looking for input and feedback on whether it makes sense uh, for some of these areas to include or not include. Thank you, Chris. Yep. Thanks. Okay, let's move on to the regulatory hearing section of our meeting. The first on our agenda is a request for amended order of conditions 129-0892, Town of Chelmsford, 1920 Dunshear Drive. Trevor Collins, Town of Chelmsford, DPW, representing the applicant. Only, I, is it Trevor or is it Tony? Because Tony's going to speak on first. Okay. Okay. All right. Mr. Chair, the legal notice here. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's right. Uh, legal notice. Legal notice under the um, provisions of the Massachusetts Wetlands Protection Act, Mass General Laws, Chapter 131, Section 40, and the Chelmsford Wetlands Bylaw, Chapter 187, the Chelmsford Conservation Commission will conduct a public hearing in Room 204 at the town offices at 50 Billerica Road on Tuesday, September 12, 2023, at 7 p.m. to consider the request for an amendment to Order of Conditions 129-0892 filed by the original applicant and property owner, Town of Chelmsford DPW. The proposed changes to the project entail installation of two 40-foot long, 60-inch diameter corrugated plastic pipes instead of the originally proposed 40-foot long, 7-foot wide by 8-foot high concrete box culvert. Mr. Chair. Thank you. Tony? Hi everyone, uh, Tony Pucci, the town engineer. Uh, with me is Trevor Collins, the assistant town engineer. 
Um, I'm just going to go over a little bit of the background of this project and then as different questions come up either I'll be able to answer or if there's things that are specific to the construction that's been ongoing over there since July 5th that's something that Trevor should be able to answer in as he's been kind of boots on the ground over there uh, ever since our contractor has mobilized in. Uh, the Dunshire Culvert uh, replacement project uh, originally started as an MVP grant application. Uh, this was over four years ago uh, when things first started to get moving on this project. Uh, during that time, there were bio swales, two box culvert replacements, uh, and with that uh, MVP grant, it was all going to be covered with uh, the cost of the project. Uh, that MVP grant was not granted to us. Uh, with that, we removed a lot of the bio swales, a lot of uh, kind of the, the extras uh, for this box culvert. During that time, the uh, lower Dunshire culvert had then failed and the stormwater division had done an emergency repair. At that time, they replaced it with two four-foot HDPE pipes, or 48-inch pipes. Uh, that's still in existence today. That emergency repair, uh, although it was done quickly and done within four days, uh, we believe to be a 30-plus year fix uh, for, for the, the, that lower culvert. Uh, so the higher culvert was then put out to bid. That bid was um, sealed bids. It was awarded in November to J.J. Phelan. Uh, that was for the seven by eight foot box culvert. Uh, that box culvert then, um, once we awarded the contract, it was supposed to be completed by April. They asked for an extension of time into the summer. And that's typically when we have the lowest flows. That's why they mobilized on July 5th. Um, as you know, we've had 35 inches of rain in June, July, and August. Uh, higher amounts of rain than we've had in a very long time during the summer. And with that, we've had a lot of issues just from the start of the project happening on July 5th. Uh, since they've mobilized in, they were setting up their bypass unit, and when they did, they hit refusal or ledge at a higher elevation than what was shown on the design documents. Uh, with that increase, uh, there's an increase in cost to have that removed. That increase in cost also has to entail the relocation of the water main, which originally was in the bid documents but was not included through the water department. Uh, so we've been looking at a couple of change orders and the cost of the project has exponentially increased uh, beyond the budget that the grant would have allowed us and then what we eventually went to capital plan or the capital funding to uh, procure uh, so with the, those changes and the difficulties that we've encountered we're here before you to change the design uh, with this the design we no longer need to go down 14 feet under the stream culvert bed uh, this would be going into refusal or ledge we're unsure at this time whether it would be drilling or blasting, but once we had it all uncovered, we'd have to come back to you to then ask for or get verification on how you'd want us to proceed with that. To do that, that culvert and that opening in the road would be for about five or six weeks. And with the weather patterns that we've had now, that is not a, that, that's just not practical. Um, and so what we're looking to do is install two five foot or 60 inch HDPE pipes. These are gonna be run in parallel together. Uh, with these two pipes being run in parallel, we don't have to relocate the water main. We don't have to remove the ledge. This is fitting much closer and much tighter to the existing condition that's there. Uh, we, we do uh, envision we might encounter a little bit of ledge, but at that point it would be a few cubic yards versus hundreds of cubic yards, and the, the savings that would be for that would just be able to, to work around that, that issue rather than having to just come back here in case it was blasting. Uh, so with the original uh, design that Weston Sampson had put together uh, for the upper Dunshire culvert, it was that seven by eight foot box culvert. Uh, the stream crossing standards, to my understanding, were not detailed as to how they were going to approach them or how they were going to comply with them. So I, I went through and I just looked at the six standards. I show uh, on the left column is the existing condition, uh, the box culvert and how it would meet it or how it uh, would fit into this and then what our proposed change is going to be uh, so standard one is a type of crossing the number one recommended is a bridge we're not doing a bridge so we do not meet that standard with the new proposal the three-sided box culvert or the box culvert that has the material in the middle would meet that standard uh, so we are deviating from that existing is a half corrugated metal pipe uh, this is four feet in diameter uh, it's an arch it doesn't really meet the criteria based on the material uh, the second standard is embedment, which is 25% or two feet. 
Uh, the existing is a bottom, uh, bottom uh, there's no existing on the bottom, so that it's just the existing subsurface of the stream, so that would meet the requirements. The box culvert is seven by eight feet, and two feet were to be filled with the existing condition, so that would meet it. Uh, we're proposing to take those five foot pipes and sink one foot into the ground, so we'd have 25% of that pipe stream, or that pipe in, in that embedded area. Uh, the third is cross span, which is 1.2 times the width. Uh, I should have our 10 foot also highlighted in red. It is not meet the standard, but it is an improvement. So 1.2 times the, the span width is the average span of the, the stream that's out there. It's between 160 and 200 inches. Uh, 10 feet is not 1.2 times that, but we are gonna install a seven feet and it's better than eight feet, which is only at the bottom of that arch. Realistically, you're looking at about a five and a half foot on the existing. So it should be almost twice as wide now uh, for aquatic life or anything else that's gonna cross through that. Uh, the openness ratio is the length versus the opening of the area. Uh, it, the current existing, it's a 0.82 is what the, the minimum standard. Uh, the box cover did meet that at 0.88 and we do meet it with 0.84 with the new change. Uh, the substrate is referring to the material on the bottom. Uh, we are putting in the same existing condition where it's gonna remove it and then put it back in place. And then finally is the water depth and velocity. Uh, I have the existing as no. Uh, when I went through and just did a calculation on the storage that that pipe can, can handle based on the spillway that's located off a Dun Dunstable Road, uh, it fails. Uh, both, the, both the box culvert and the proposed change to the two five-foot pipes uh, can handle the flow that comes out of the spillway. Now that's not to say that the entire area that doesn't en encounter flooding, this isn't just from the spillway, this is backwater conditions that are coming up from the Merrimack, down from uh, Tingsboro Road and Butterfield with those other culverts that aren't part of this project. Uh, but so there are some other extenuating issues downstream that can cause this area to flood. But the, the two pipes are designed to meet the 100 year storm event that can go through the spillway. And so at that point, the spillway may fail due to the FEMA flood map, in which case that's just because of the elevation that's out there. And again, it's backwater from the Merrimack River. It has nothing to do with the sizing of the culverts or the sizing of the spillway. It has to do with the elevation of Dunshire itself. Uh, sorry. Is the the last line on the area? Uh, is the area of the water flow? Is that so? That's just a, that was just that's not one of the standards. I just want to show you that the the rough square footage that's existing now is twenty five point one three. That's if it was a perfect arc. Uh, there are deformities in the pipe, so it's actually less than that. The box culvert would have the two foot on the sand bed, so it would be seven feet by five feet, so thirty five foot area. And we're looking to put in thirty three point six eight feet. Uh, just it's just a, a really easy way just to look at as the area that the water can flow through. Um, at a minimum, when we're trying to meet those standards, uh, it comes to the maximum extent practicable. Uh, this isn't a new subdivision, and so we are trying to do that. And part of the reason we can't meet stormwater, the, excuse me, the stream crossing standards is the same reason why we're here before you. It's the engineering design constraints, as well as the cost of replacement. Uh, this was a capital funding project that was approved through town meeting. Uh, those funds would be exhausted, and we would need to go back to town meeting with the design as is, with the change orders that have been encountered or will be encountered if we continue with the project as is. Uh, so we're here before you now so we can deviate from that with a, a cost savings, of uh, an engineered cost savings. And with this design, we believe it would be like the lower Dunshire where you're going to get over 30 years from this material and, and from this repair. Uh, but it would allow us to get the work done this year and this season. We would only need about four dry days in a row to get this work done. That's not the road and the guardrails and the paving, but for physically removing the existing culvert and putting in the two five-foot pipes. Okay. Uh, do you have a question on that? Or? <coughs> uh, I just wanted to go over uh, the work schedule. Uh, if it is approved tonight, uh, the material has already been ordered. Uh, there was a lag time for this, and if the project is not approved, that's something that the town, we're just gonna, we'll still own those pipes and we'll have to hopefully use them somewhere else in the future. Uh, but so that has been ordered on September 1st. We're hoping for delivery between now and September 27th. Uh, we'd be looking to do the stream bypass and demolition of the culvert on October 2nd, installation of the pipe within two days of that on October 4th. On October 6th, we would deactivate that stream bypass and finish stabilizing the road. During that time, the pump and the, um, the pumps will be running 24 hours just with the flow that's out there now. This is why if we were to try to maintain and go back with that box culvert design, which may take five or six weeks, uh, the noise and just the, the sheer issue of trying to go through that project would just be a nightmare for the residents that have already been dealing with this for five years. Uh, if we can get this done and wrapped up within four days of an inconvenience, it's something that hopefully they'd be able to get through. Um, 
Finally, on October 9th, there's coordination with National Grid paving guardrail installation. We'll be looking to install guardrail on the lower Dunshire as well, as right now that's just had the Jersey barriers located there ever since the emergency repair. I, I was going to ask you that. Are they going so they'll be removed? Yeah, so we'll be looking to remove those and install guardrail on that end. Uh, and then by the end of October, we'll be hoping to have punch list items, final walkthrough with conservation, make sure we've restored everything back to the natural uh, habitat that it was in before. Everything's running and flowing correctly and then we would be able to, to get out of Dunshire. Does anyone have any questions or comments? I think we do. I okay. think we do. So, um, David, do you want to start with uh, kind of your assessment of what you've seen and heard? Sure. Um, Can so you just make sure you sit forward? Um, so, Tony, um, I, I just want to clarify, I mean, you just mentioned you still have to do the, by the bypass or still the plan to do the bypass. So the bypass is currently they were installing it. There is the gravity bypass and then they're going to have the pump bypass, but we still need it. So the dam would still, uh, the, excuse me, the stream would still have to be um, blocked, have the stream diverted around the area during the demolition as well as the construction up until we had both of the pipes set in. Um, and then have it backfilled enough so there wouldn't be any pore pressure to lift it once that bypass is brought down to let water pass through again. So, 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 uh, so I just want to make sure I understand. Is, so, is the bypass completely um, installed already? I believe you said that 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 was being affected by the ledge as well. So the gravity uh, bypass, so that it doesn't overtop, was affected by the ledge. That's where we encountered it at the highest elevation. Okay. And as far as uh, that's for an emergency overflow to prevent overtopping, and then they're going to have a larger size pump to keep up with the flow that we are encountering now versus the flow on the design plans from 2019. So the elevation on the design plan was 19, uh, 96.2 plus minus, and right now we vary between 96.8 and 99. So with the weather that we've had and the rainstorm and intensities, uh, groundwater is saturated, so everything is kind of just sheer running right into that, that stream and running down. Um, so that's why the pump would be on uh, for the full amount of time, 24 hours for those four days. Okay. So, um, so I was out there today to take a look at it, um, and uh, there the, the water level is very high. Um, I, I walked around with a couple of residents for, um, for quite a while, and, and, and it appears that, um, that the source of the backup, or the main cause of the backup, is actually downstream. Of, of actually the two culverts on Dunshire, um, I uh, want one of the uh, the, the residents uh, who knows the area quite well says that he, he believes that the um, that the backup is uh, of the water is due in large part to beaver dams. But but you <laughs> sent me an email today saying that there the police had done a. Uh, drone flight over it and doesn't look like there are so any beaver dams. we've had a lot of calls for beavers uh, though goes through our stormwater division uh, both Courtney Thompson our stormwater engineer and Rob Wood our stormwater superintendent have been going on site we've been working with beaver trapping we've been getting the emergency permits if needed we've been trying to locate the dams uh, we cannot locate them he's been walking through backyards he's been over there numerous times we've walked down through uh, beyond uh, Tingsboro Road down over to Woten uh, so we did bring the police out there this morning at 10 a.m. We did do the drone flyover. I've not had enough time to fully review that, but when I was out there, I didn't see anything that seemed like a dam. Um, but we are hoping that maybe we can find something that we weren't able to see by um, just as we were doing the, the walks. There's just a lot of areas you can't really get into. Uh, so we're hoping this can find something. Then we would then follow up with the rent necessary permits with Conservation Board of Health, depending on what we were able to find. Okay. Well, um, the, the resident is here tonight, and he probably will want to say something later on. But, but um, I certainly think that uh, if there were beaver dams, a dam or dams that were found out there that were causing the water to back up, I think it would make an awful lot of sense from, from the standpoint of this project to remove them first. You know, get the water level as low as possible before before then the, the culvert is installed it's just yeah. trying to locate them uh, i know that rob's been out there numerous times over the last few weeks okay. uh, we find beavers that we can see beavers we can see nine on trees we mm -hmm. can't locate the beaver and we can't locate the dam and without either having one of those then we can't go get the permits to follow through on anything unfortunately yes. uh, so if anyone does find one or has a picture or can show us you can please contact our stormwater division let us know exactly where you saw it and that way we can go out and try to get the eyes on it so we can follow up with those permits but <coughs> uh, it is something that's been an ongoing issue for beavers this summer uh, I think with the high water, they've been relocating in different locations, and it's causing backups all over town. So, David, are you suggesting there are two problems? Well, um, one's a downstream beaver problem, and one's a culvert problem. Uh, 
well uh, and aren't they here to solve the COVID problem well but 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 i but i think that um to get the, the water level as low as possible will facilitate the culvert problem the installation of the culvert i, I think i think i think there's all, uh, another problem is is down at the culvert that goes under route 3a so, I think so that is owned by mass dot that, that, that that's right and we're not going to solve that problem anytime soon but that probably has something to do with it as well I, I do think that culvert, uh, and it's something that uh, if there were cost savings from this through that capital, uh, we are looking to potentially try to go back to town meeting to use the funds that are saved to do a watershed analysis using the Tingsboro culvert and the culvert on Butterfield Lane as the two primary sources uh, for that study to look at the greater area of collection that's going through there. I know one is a four foot stone culvert and one's a five foot box culvert. To me, those seem like they should be sized up larger, but we need to do that study. And then hopefully once we have that study, we can then persuade MassDOT to do the work on it. it it's, it's not owned by the town, and so we, we can't go before you to get that done, but we can do steps, and we would be looking to do steps in the future to try to do that. It's another thing uh, I did want to bring up is the vegetation growth between Tingsboro and Butterfield. Uh, if we potentially may come back for an RDA so we could do something in November just to clear out that area so that the stream has more capacity. I know that stream over the years, at least from residents that I've heard, it's been getting more and more overgrown. I have found a report from 2020 indicating it needed to be cleaned out. I couldn't find record that it was done. If anyone here knows that it was done, that would be great. Uh, but that's something we'd be looking to try to do. The best time of year to do it would be November uh, when everything's cold, everything's dark, uh, excuse me, uh, it's dry, that's easiest to get through it and we'll be able to remove the vegetation that's in there. Um, and that's a walkthrough that I was hoping to plan in, in later a few weeks or so. Well, hopefully once the culvert was replaced and then we could try to get more storage in the stream while we then work on the mass DOT problem. Okay, so um, I don't have any more questions, but I recommend the commission approve this, this amendment. I think it's just, uh, justified. Okay, let's uh, ask the rest what, of the commission, uh, why don't we? Can someone ref remind me what, if any special order of conditions were on the original? None. They none. Were none. They were none. <coughs> Um, How I, do we know this is going to work? The two five foot versus the two uh, versus the box culvert. Yeah, the first one didn't work. Ah, uh, so well, there's no, there's not, there's not existing two five foot. No, uh, no, the first one didn't work. That's why you're here tonight. Right? Oh well, so in that one How we were we going down one, fourteen feet versus six feet. Uh, so just the the reality of trying to do that type of construction, the timing on only doing four days versus six weeks. Uh, we have seen. You can look at these people in the audience and tell them it's going to work. We should be able to get it in and installed. And so the four foot pipes on the lower Dunshire with the flooding issue still have capacity in it. So it's not the culverts that's failing. It's the stream and the backflow that's actually the, the problem on this. And that's something that either replacement we do here isn't gonna solve that problem. That problem's further downstream. But this, by putting these I've, installation hey, in would solve the I've been on the commission the 34 years and this is not the first time Dunshire Drive has been before us with the same problem. Fix it. The All I gotta say. Okay. 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 Chris, do you have a uh, question? Just kind of following up. I mean, <clears throat> my concern is, you know, do we have a design that's large enough to get the job done? Yeah. So uh, that's my question. With the spillway in 2010, the dam did a. Uh, there was a report done on the spillway in the dam that goes underneath Dunstable Road. With that, it indicated a hundred-year storm event would be 216 cubic feet per second. The two five-foot pipes that are put together. Uh, are 200 and 295.66 cubic feet per second. So it, the pipes are, would be sized uh, appropriately for a 100-year storm event, as long as the stream and everything else has the capacity to let the water flow and there's no backup or anything that's, that's slowing the actual volume of water passing through. Uh, the existing right now can only do 152 cubic feet a second, so it would be undersized in that event. Uh, the box culvert was 550 cubic feet. It's, uh, as far as a volume location, it, it was significantly oversized. Um, but 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 then but then the two four foot culverts just downstream would still be able to handle the capacity after these yes are installed yes right, you have, you I don't have that number in front of me but I did verify that I believe it was at 216 is what the uh, Q100 and I believe it was 248 when I get back to the office I can just forward you the that calculation on it I don't remember off the top of my head I, I, I can easily believe it they're they, they're not a capacity right now so yeah. so I'm confident that that's the case y'all say Chris good. Uh, Mark? You say this new fix is going to last the duration of 30 years plus. Is that what you're saying, me? With general maintenance, yes. <coughs> this is a simpler, less expensive. <coughs> Why wasn't this the it, first choice? It was originally both culverts were to be repaired with an MVP grant, 
And so as part of doing the MVP grant, they went with the box culvert design. I don't think you would get the grant if you decided to go with the two pipes or to go with HDPE as your material for the culvert. Um, so I think because it was originally an MVP grant, that grant was not awarded, and then things were pulled away from it, I don't think anyone decided just to do a redesign at that point. It was just salvage what was left. Unfortunately, it wasn't here at the time, uh, but it looks like they just salvaged what was left and could be used, then go get funding through town meeting, and then move forward with the project. Well, well Tony, you did mention that geotechnical borings were done so the prior to the, um, the original. The, there design. were borings done, uh, and they were located 15 feet uh, three of them 15 feet apart. Some of them are outside of the work zone. Uh, I wasn't here for when those were done. I don't know why none were done on the side that we encountered the refusal. Uh, I don't know what the indication or how the, that way they were instructed to do that. Uh, so unfortunately, uh, speaking with Weston Sampson, a lot of their team also isn't around uh, from that, that who did that design during the process. Uh, but that wouldn't impact uh, the type of material. That's just, they, they did that as part of the MVP grant, I, I believe, making sure they, they could try to go with that box culvert. I think a lot of decisions were designed thinking that the grant would get approved. And once that grant got approved, then it would be able to move forward with, uh, excuse me, like the Cadillac of whatever you could think of and design in that area. And so once that didn't go through, things started to get pulled away. And then uh, this is kind of where we're left now. It kind of seems to me that it was rushed to get through without enough thought. It's hindsight now. Is the uh, road capacity going to be the same with the box covered in the plastic pipes? I'm sorry, is the, the, the road capacity for vehicles going over it? Uh, yes, the, the pipes are rated for H20, so there shouldn't be any issues as long as there's two feet of cover and we have over two feet of cover. Okay, that's all I got now. Where, where on Dunshire Drive is this project? Uh, this is the upper Dunshire, so if you head down uh, and you take your first left, it's uh, next to house, I believe, 38, 39, excuse me. Yeah, so it's, it's Is this where we had the site walk in the fall? No. This is a we different not, location. We have not done Dunshire. Yes, we did. The state. In the last year. No, I wasn't there. I, don't I was that. there. But I don't think that's where this is. So, so you see where I'm, I'm circling the pointer? That's where this is? I can't. <laughs> that's 20. <coughs> that's 19. Yeah, but. See, but this is. It's. It, it's, it's the. the right. uh, it's at the other end. Yeah. It's right here. Yeah, it's but, right but there. this hearing is 19 and 20. That was, that was incorrect. Oh. So I apologize for <laughs> oh. that. That was. <laughs> so this is not for 19 and 20. Dungeons. Correct. What are the correct. street numbers this is for? Excuse me. Excuse me. Let let the conservation agents. It's 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 a 39, and let me see. So this is this is 39 right here. Um, okay, so that is the one we walked with the state a couple of years ago, right? And DPW. Okay. Now I know where we are. I thought you were in a different part of Dunshire because, frankly, <coughs> Dunshire has had flooding problems even down at 19 and 20. So and, <laughs> and, that, and that's and that's where the, the that could be where the beaver dam is, right? Right. right that's right. That's right. Well, no, I think that's further downstream. <laughs> downstream, yeah. On our property. Anything else, Dave? <laughs> Bill, um, I have no problem with the pipes. There's two five footers. I think your problem is. I went out there today too. And I think your problem is downstream. It's always been, a, <clears throat> as far as I can remember, it's right. always been a problem right. further down. So I think that needs to be addressed. So we will be doing that wor uh, that watershed study as long as we can get the funding to move forward with that. And then we will be looking to come back to do that work in November after talking with David on what would be required for that. Because uh, if you if you drive down Duncia and you go around the circle, on the right hand side. You, there's uh, houses that the water's coming up. There's a, there's a swimming pool surrounded with water in the backyard. So that whole wetland area behind Cow Gills and down that way is just backing up into that's the yard. That's in, the flood area on I, Kingsborough Road. Right. So I think ultimately the whole network should have been done prior to replacing culverts. Uh, one culvert was already emergency repair. Gee. My guess is that they were in bad condition. That's why these were chosen to be done now, and the whole greater area wasn't done. I wasn't here, unfortunately, when that, to, to make that decision or to go through it. I just, if we can get this done, we do have plans to, knowing that Dunshire has those flooding issues, I know that elevation over there amongst the houses is less than 100. The, the FEMA floodplain is 104 in that that backwater 
is an issue that's going through there down over at Tingsboro Road. Uh, but that's nothing that I can fix or solve now. No, I get um, that. And it is something that we are going to be looking forward with. But I think uh, we need to follow through on that because this isn't going to solve the problem. Really, isn't it too okay. bad the state of Massachusetts? The state was in here. When we were doing the sidewalks. Right. I brought it up God when they came it. in here two months ago. The state came in to put a sidewalk down Tingsboro Road. And I brought up this exact issue right. that we have a problem on Dunshire and there's culverts going underneath Tingsboro Road. Mm -hmm and whether that was looked at at all. And we actually postponed our meeting to, an, to the following meeting so that the town could look at that and see they if there's any input. They didn't want to listen to us. So. Hopefully we'll have better luck if we can have a study to show them that it's, it's, uh, it's undersized. But that's something that we can't, we'll have no, to go through and go. But as far as what you're in here for, I have no problem with the five, two five-foot pipes. Okay. You said the, the temporary pipe is coming out that's there now? The uh, well, the bypass is gonna would be maintained and used until it was constructed, and then that's everything coming out be, after. Yes, everything would be removed after. Okay. All right, now I'm fine. Thanks. Yeah, Peter. Oh, hi. Uh, just quickly, thank you for thinking about the stream crossing standards. It's important long term. I know flooding's more current topic for tonight. And my second question, I just I, I believe I understand this, um, but I want to be sure. So your analysis of, of the hydrology and the water flow is the size of these pipes really would not change the flooding problem because the flooding is from a backup further downstream. Yeah, the, the, yeah, the flooding is not from flow coming from upstream. The no. flooding, from my understanding, from being out there this morning, from being out there over the last few months, it is being derived from, from downstream. Yeah. And so it, it's just that the water has no place to go. Part of that is that there's no stream storage. Yeah. Once you get between Butterfield and Tingsboro, Tingsboro is that four foot stone culvert that the state owns. And then as you make your way out of town. Um, so once those can get looked at, that may be able to solve some of the problem. Once the stream can get cleaned out a little, that overgrowth can be removed. You can get more stream storage. Uh, I know if it wasn't this condition, if it was a drought, we may be looking at trying to do uh, sand removal or sediment removal throughout that stream. But this isn't a time or a year that we would even be able to, to think about that. Uh, but so I, we do have different options or things that we are looking at for the Dunshire area. It's just none of those options, though, or anything has anything to do with the, the culvert design itself. Right. Thank you for confirming that. No Thank you. John? I'm just wondering about the eastern side, the emergency repair. Yes. You're sure them pipes are going to handle the five foot pipes? Well, so it's five foot pipes with one foot of material. So they don't function as a four foot pipe, but they're essentially like a four and a half because we have that sediment on the bottom, the subsurface uh, from the, the stream itself. So they are mirroring closer to that four, those two four foot pipes. Those four foot pipes don't have any of the material that's in it. So that's why they can function for the flow without any issues. They do today. Hmm? They do today. They do today. Yes. They have sediment at the bottom. Well, so when we were over there, it was about two inches or so, and that's just from stream going through it. It's not the designed one foot of crossing material. The crushed stone that you Oh, we'll have to take another look at it. I know when we were out there about a week or two ago, we, when we were trying to verify the depth of it. It was about two inches. So, so let's let's. Keep we're talking right, about three hundred feet between the two crossings. Yes. Three to four hundred feet. It would be common sense to use the same size pipe within three hundred feet. I could use two four-foot pipes if you like. <laughs> no, I, I, what I'm saying is, you're proposing fives. You did an emergency repair. Right. Did you look at five footers? The reason we're looking at five footers is to try to do to meet any of the stream crossing standards. We could do two four foot to match downstream, but we're looking to get that one foot of material in the pipe. We can remove that one foot of material and then we would downsize the pipe to four feet. I will agree. I walked the I walked up there today. I was there when Billy was there. I went down to Tingsboro Road. The major problem is the state crossing. Yes. There's a single vortex about a foot and a half around going in. You can see where a bunch of debris has been pulled out. Mm -hmm. there, there's something going on with that crossing there. Yes. Okay. It, it's a four foot box culvert. I'm okay. uh, sorry, stone culvert, which means that it also has the most friction and it slows water down. It's also the smallest size culvert in that chain. All right, I understand that. But what I'm saying is, I'm looking at a vortex of the water going down. I walk to the other side of the road. And the water's coming out fine. I go down towards the ball fields, and everything's flowing fine. Okay. Okay. The, the problem is right at the state. Okay. Yes. Okay. The emergency repair 
in my opinion, and this is only my opinion, I am not an engineer, but if I was putting pipe in, I would size the pipe here and here the same size. If we made the Dunshire crossings smaller, so one four foot pipe, we would just have more flooding issues that we would have created in between that 300 foot section of Dunshire to match a four foot square culvert on Tingsboro. So we want to design them for the 100 year storm events so that when it flows through. We're getting 100 year storm events every week in this town. Okay? Right, but so. We're getting two and a half inches of rain overnight last night. In Chumsford. But so that, that's an issue with the Tingsboro culvert, not, not the two four foot culverts. So what, if that was sized to say an eight foot box culvert and water flows through. I'm a firm believer in a box culvert, concrete box culvert. Thank you. I'm a firm believer in that. The way it was drawn up in the plans, that's the way it should have went. That's what we approved. Okay. Okay. That's what I believe in. I believe in. A bridge crossing, box culvert, concrete, it's there forever. I don't know about the emergency repair. It should have been five feet. I'm not an engineer. Okay, so um, anything else, John? No, I'm just stating my opinion. Yep, okay. Any more, any more questions from the commission? We're going to open it up to the public. Uh, Tony, you have anything else you want to add? No. Nope. David? No. Okay, uh, we're going to open it up to the public. Um, we're um, open for any kind of input and questions. Um, Tony can respond or we can respond. If, you, um, if you've heard your question already asked, uh, please refrain from asking it again. But uh, please, please come up to the, uh, to the podium and um, make sure it's conservation. And, yeah, and make, um, give your name and your address. And just please make sure that it's addressed to this particular issue, which <laughs> is the replacement of the culvert. That's in this Absolutely. Place. Yep. John Kelly, I live at 38 Dunshire Drive, also known as Ground Zero. First, I just have to mention how disappointed myself and my neighbors are and how difficult it is to get anything done for the citizens of North Chelmsford. That being said, we're here to address the COVID. Okay? We're here to ask you this is after two failed attempts to approve the least expensive, easiest, and least desirable plan possible, okay? Apparently we have to do this because we're under a lot of pressure to get this done, all because we're out of time, because we haven't worked on this covid in two months, haven't done a thing. So now we're under a time constraint. We understand this has to get approved, and I asked um, David, Cuns to look into a few situations for us, and he was fantastic about coming out right away. He was one of the few people that did come on and look and study the brook with us, and I appreciate that a lot. And I asked him to look at a few, like for instance, the beavers and stuff like that. He did that. I appreciate it. If we could go back to that drawing which shows the the flow patterns sure. that end. This one. This one, John? No, it was the one that showed the, the difference between the arch culvert, the box culvert, and the two five-foot pipes. The table? Yeah, the chart. Yes, the oh, table. Oh, the table, okay. Okay. So if I'm looking at this correctly, I'm going to look behind me. I apologize. The existing says embedded 25% two feet. And the one next to it, which is the box culvert, says buried in the sediment two feet minimum. And then we look at the proposed pipe, which only says 25%. 25% of five feet, I believe, is one foot three inches. And yet, so we're gonna put this, we, you already saw how many houses are affected by flood water in their backyard. And you wanna put this pipe in, was that nine inches shallower? just doesn't seem like it's gonna work out. We're gonna have this problem a lot more often and it's getting worse and worse. Like you said, we have rain every two, we have this problem every two weeks. We do have to address farther down, but that's another time. 
Right now, we have to address this COVID. And I just wish you look at some of these numbers. And then finally, when you put two five feet pipes together, there's no way to pack, pack in between them. I'm not an engineer, but I've seen a lot of COVIDs where they put at least a minimum of one foot of material in between the two pipes. Because otherwise, there's nothing to prevent the current from going through there and just taking away the material causing an hourglass effect at the top where the dirt constantly falls in and the road collapses just like it did in the 50 years that I lived here in two culverts. Thank you very much and I appreciate you all. Thank you. Anyone else? Come on right up. Hi, Michelle Caputo, Starkweather, 19 Dunshire Drive, Ground Zero, lower level. So we now have a beaver who has diplomatic immunity. He goes swimming up and down the brook. Um, and that's something I've been calling on for quite some time. I understand there's whole rules on how long into the season you can trap a beaver. But um, he's the request that was we can't find the dams. So if you know where they are, he has blocked off that m water mitigation ditch. I don't think he's living in it, but now my water mitigation ditch is like mosquito nursery and it's blocking up and it's gone into my yard it's gone into John's yard it's gone well actually you don't really have the water mitigation ditch Patty's yard is full and um, like the back corners and now it's gone over the berm and it's coming up into the yard so I, you know of course I made that phone call this afternoon going oh my god so um, we do have beavers back there I know some of you I know it's like kind of weirdly wooded and they're the the apartment buildings own part of that land and cat stories I think if you came through the back of cat stories you'd be able to find the ditch better than when you go through my backyard because my backyard is just weirdly wooded um, but there's definitely beavers living back there and they're building things and they're blocking off that water mit mitigation ditch and that is creating an additional level of flooding I know it's not exactly the culvert but since the subject was all of the flooding of Dunshire Drive yep. If you guys could maybe do something to make that open again and let the water back out, that'd be so awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? How you doing? Uh, Brandon Kelly. I'm 16 Kelso Road, but longtime <coughs> resident of Dunshire. Uh, also a former DPW director, so I'm well aware of what you guys are all going through right now. Um, I just think that you know we should really reconsider the way that we install these pipes. Uh, two five-foot pipes that are not being grant funded in any way, why are we trying to meet stream water crossing standards? We did an emergency repair, the town did an emergency repair, and did two four-foot pipes, right? In, in hindsight, it probably wasn't the most ideal situation. But we're now going to take two pipes that aren't going to get any type of funding outside of what our taxpayers pay. And we're going to now limit them on purpose kind of doesn't make sense we've already limited with four footers downstream now the beaver dam is a bigger issue but those who have lived here all of these people i've helped them carry sandbags for years and years okay my aunt who lives at 39 is upstream of all of this same with mike and i've watched their yards flood and it's not because of the backup the backup happens days later when the merrimack rises Okay, but as the water flows down, there's either beaver dams and stuff that get taken down from upstream and it all gets caught in these culverts. Okay, a round pipe is designed as a temporary. There's a reason that they went to box culverts, okay? They do not catch the material like a round pipe does, okay? To my father's point, you, you're gonna have a guaranteed sinkhole. If you don't have concrete at the upper, at the face of it, and at the downstream side of it, it's gonna, two pipes are gonna vortex and they're gonna erode under that road as quick as possible. So I appreciate the study that they have done, but I think the 30 year fix, we all know in 30 years, we're never gonna come back to Dunshire Drive. The, the funding is just not here in this town, okay? We're gonna be back on Chelmsford Street or one of these other streets that we just redid. We need to really rethink this. And I understand it might mean that the, that the problem doesn't get fixed this month or next month but we're throwing you know good money at bad money type of deal and that we're not going to be able to have a sustainable culvert at either one of them pretty soon you'll be lucky if you see 15 years out of it 
Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. John Anderson, 17 Dunshire, uh, and a butter at the lower level as well. Um, to echo that, I've cleaned those culverts out three times since they've been in, installed. They get jammed up with um, wood coming down um, and debris. So that's definitely a problem. Um, so either the town you know, makes a, some sort of, um, you know, comes periodically, checks on them, because I've d had to do that a couple of times. On the beavers, I lost four one-foot maples this spring to beaver, and my neighbor has lost two on the other side. Um, so there's definitely beaver activity. Um, if I'll put my waders on and take anybody out there that wants to find that dam. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, let me just ask you a question of the yeah. group. Yeah. Do you think, let me ask you a question of the, sit forward a little bit. of the committee as well as, the, do you think if we address the beaver problem first yeah. and the culvert problem second that, and let us direct the highway department to do a better engineering study, whatever that means? You think that would work, or is the situation so dire that the work on the culvert has to be done immediately? I don't know the answer to that. Well, I mean, it seems to me as if you could, if, if you can locate the Beaver Dam, which you should be able to do, you can address that problem very quickly. And it's also, from what I heard tonight, I'm not so sure this is the right engineering solution to the problem at the culvert area. And I'd like some reassurance that that's this that we're not doing it. We're not going to be have these guys back here a third time. <clears throat> Anybody want to respond or any? Yeah, go ahead. Come on up. <coughs> Thank you. My name is Jerry Me uh, Jean Arena from Thirty Nine Dunshire, and her late husband were my best friends, and I've dealt with Jeannie and her late husband Joe for probably 40 years and dealing sandbagging in the garage doors and dealing with the floods back there. And I think this is positive in a sense that something's going on, but there's a lot of concerns and I think there's a lot of great points that were raised. Personally, in, with my history, which I was a retired superintendent of public works, the box culvert is the best as Brandon Kelly had stated. Uh, I think that everyone has been put in a strange position here right now is you've got construction going on, you've got a collapsed culvert, you got a 30 inch bypass, which is insufficient in my mind, although today the flow is half full and the culvert is still taking some. Construction with a road blocked off and my understanding is a water line dead ended, which creates water quality issues as well. Something needs to be done. My opinion, the two five foot uh, HDP pipes is not a bad if you calculate them out. I had good conversation with Trevor uh, that the calculation was done on a 100-year storm. Most drain systems were designed for a 25-year storm years ago. A 100-year storm is a good one. However, as you said, we have 100-year storms every week. You know, a 500-year storm now is a monthly event. You know, I don't think you're ever going to deal with the draining situa drainage situation through the whole area. But I'm a little bit concerned that the segmented approach, should we do the beaver yep. dams first, should we do the culvert, should we do it? And you're missing the point of the, what I refer to as an easement, the drainage mitigation area that runs up behind the houses, which for 30 years I've known with my, my best friend there that that was 18 inches full of muck. And that's a lot of compensatory storage that you could be using that would reduce the floodage, flooding in the areas of all these houses on the backside, you know, I mean, it's going to flood, it's going to rain. People, I think, are, are used to the water coming up. It's just to what level? Yeah. And do you want to acerbate the situ situation for these residents? You know, something needs to be done. I think you've been put in a weird position here that how do we apply for a box culvert grant and not get the grant but yet move ahead with it and how do we end up now with two five-foot diameters? Should the two five-foot diameters be reduced to a four-foot because of the well, one foot of uh, two feet of sand on the base of the pipe. I mean, I, it's been a long time since I calculated pi, but those numbers don't work, reducing them down to a four foot. I think the four foot was a mistake. Four foot should have been designed for a 100-year storm too. What that was designed for, I know. All that being said, I think this Trevor and this Tony, who I've never met, and I only met Trevor tonight, 
I applaud them as far as moving forward and getting something done. And I applaud them as far as for moving forward with a waste um, a water mitigation studies. <coughs> Excuse me. And I think all these are positive steps. You need to address the impact that these people are having right now. Yep. There's major storms coming from them. Uh, there was discussion about the bypasses open and that when they start construction, they're not pumping. What are they going to do tomorrow if we get two inches of rain or whatever's predicted? How is things going to work there? Dealing with the state is always a problem. I, I've dealt with that for 100 years, and I'm sure you have too. But that doesn't mean that we don't do the best job all the way up the, stand, up the line. Find the beaver dams, remove the beaver dams, take some type of mitigation to resolve the problem and come up with the best design. And it sure seems like to me that this Conservation Commission is willing to work with the Engineering Department and the Public Works Department to get a positive solution. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, I was going to ask Tony if you wanted to come up. There were a few points made that um, maybe you can uh, address. And so as far as the, the beaver and the, the culvert, uh, it, we're, not, we're not, not actively looking for beavers. That is an ongoing thing. That means tomorrow we'll look for them. We'll look for them for the rest of the week. Uh, by trying to put one before the other, we, we are looking for the beavers. We know that's a problem. We've done taking down two dams in that area this summer. We've trapped three beavers in that area, I believe, this summer. It's an issue that has just been ongoing and keeps getting worse and worse. So we are trying to do that. It's just it seems like a task that we, we, we can't get a firm handle because it's located in one spot. When we investigate that spot, it's in another location. And so it is a little bit of chasing your tail, trying to locate the beavers, locate the dams, get the traps set, make sure that we can do that. That is something that DBW is going to continue to do. We'll work on for the we'll remainder of this season. Um, yep. I'm not saying that we will, we're will. we going to stop looking at it. We will continue to look for those beaver dams. So I just want to let you know that that's something that the Stormwater Division will actively continue to do, uh, yep. independent of what you decide or vote on for tonight's culvert design. Uh, that, that's a separate issue that is going to be trying to be solved and looked into through DPW, regardless of what happens with the culvert. Um, as far as uh, there were some comments on whether it was designed correctly, uh, so it is designed for the 100-year capacity flow that can go through the pipe. Uh, that is something that the bulk culvert could also do. Um, that is something that I believe, looking up what I did in my notes, I have to just go back to my office, but the four-foot pipes do match or exceed that 216 cubic feet a second that the spillway has for the 100-year storm event. So e all of those would, would uh, work for that 100-year storm. The reason that it's a five-foot pipe with 25% of the pipe filled is on round culvert pipes for stream crossing standards. That's the recommended is 25%. That's why we chose 25% of the pipe. That wasn't a number we magically pulled. That's a number strictly from the stormwater handbook, uh, excuse me, the stream crossing handbook as something that we were trying to do to match the, the stream crossing standard the best possible way that we could for this area. We've seen the, wet, uh, the wildlife, we've seen different uh, fish or anything that's in that brook, and so we were just trying to do the best that we could in that area. Uh, as far as the funding and going forward, uh, if the project does get denied and we need to go uh, stick with the box culvert, we will have to go back to town meeting. We need to request more funds. There's not enough funds that we have allocated at this time to finish the project as is. So we wouldn't be delayed in three weeks or two months. We'd be looking at next spring or next summer. The Dunshire Road would be closed for all of winter. Uh, we'd have to have it fenced off. We'd have to put in Jersey barriers. We'd most likely have JJ Phelan pull out their material and everything that's there. And we'd have to just, we wouldn't be able to revisit this until spring or summer, as long as we were able to get that other funding, whether through October or, or April town meeting. Uh, to, to move forward with if we have to continue and enforce the, the box culvert in there. Oh. Yeah. Tony, uh, can you explain the construction, how the head wall with the two five-foot pipes are going to come out? How are you going to construct that? Because there's a question on how long it's going to last and there's going to be issues with that. So can you explain Do that? Do you mind if I just let Trevor answer that? He went in through, did a lot of the detailed work on that. And I Another wanna... question is, is there any place in town where you have two pipes in a similar situation? Outside of the lower Dunshire? Not that I can think of off the top of my head. Okay. Um, just give me a minute to think of that, and I'll just let Trevor answer your, your first question. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> so uh, th the way this varies in construction from the original design is, you know, what we're going to do is we excavate down to uh, one foot below or two feet below the stream bed material. We're going to lay down uh, filter fabric, place in one foot of crushed stone, um, f uh, as a sub base for the uh, two 60-inch pipe culverts 
the filter fabric will then wrap completely over the stone so that the uh, stone is pretty much sealed, right, in its own separate layer. And then we lay the, uh, the uh, two pipes on, on that filter fabric. And then from there, what we do is we, over, over the top of the, the two pipes, we can separate them a little bit because they have their corrugated pipes, so we can sprinkle in small 3 8 half inch stone between the two pipes to fill that void um, to get the void in the middle filled and then you completely backfill the rest with gravel um, you know it takes a day to a day or two to fully excavate uh, another day to prep and another day to place the pipes in and and backfill and stabilize the whole area in order to you know allow the stream essentially to open back up through it um, Obviously, the other thing that we would have to do prior to opening up the stream is getting the sending in the stream bed material, which will probably most likely be all handwork, where guys are sh shoveling in the existing stream bed material into the pipe to get that 25% coverage. Um, after you know we get it all backfilled, uh, we put the riprap edging uh, on the sides, built that up, and that's also sitting on filter fabric for separation, which you know is good for erosion control, and uh, so you don't get washouts. Um, and you slowly build that up with your sub base of the road, you know, so everything's nice and stable up until your top of slope of the roadway. Um, once you have that, you pave it, and then you get the guardrail in. Um, and all the miscellaneous loam work and, and things of that nature. Um, it's, a, it's a lot quicker um, uh, than, than the previous design. Like I said, it was uh, when I first received the schedule from JJ Phelan of the original uh, box culvert design, it was five to six weeks without ledge removal. You probably have one to two weeks of ledge removal additional to that five to six weeks if we have to go and move, remove that ledge. And that's not to include the fact that we'd have to come back here and get some type of approval on how we would go about doing that once that happens. So you, the reason it's been on hold for so long is because we haven't had the weather uh, t in order to complete the bypass and make it fully operational knowing we can safely get this done. You know, five to six weeks is a lot of time. The weather patterns are ridiculous. Uh, and if we can find one week of time to go do this, which, you know, two weeks ago there would have been that time, we could have got it done. Um, so that's why we're here now. Okay. Uh, Peter? Yeah. Um, Trevor? I have a question that's not fair, but maybe you've thought about it. <laughs> so if you've thought about it, great. And if not, no big deal. What's the rough cost difference all in? between the, the two five-inch diameter ones and the longer duration box culvert. Just super ballpark. I mean, is it 10 times different cost? Uh, we did a rough estimate. It's box culvert is around two, two and a half times more. Two, two and a half. Yeah. And of course, a year or more delay. Yeah, and that's that's with that. Yeah, that's with the ledge removal that we're expecting. So you know, it, and that's just a rough f estimate because it could yep. be three times depending on what the ledge is looking like. Because like I said, we have to also lo relocate the water main uh, because it has to go so much lower. So two, I would say two to three times difference. Yeah. Thank you, John. Did you? I have get a question. question on the head wall. Uh, just the riprap, no concrete head wall or anything. Um, it, yeah, we. I just was trying because to because there's emergency repair. If you look at that, it was an emergency repair. Understood. Okay, the the riprap is right at the edge of the pipe. Okay, I've seen concrete pipe. Concrete head wall. I mean, did we look at that at all? Uh, we did, and the reason we stuck with the rep wrap is again schedule. When you look at trying to form pour concrete, you're adding. They make they pour these things every day. They make them. Yeah. Well, you gotta. Well, we would. The contractor would most likely like to form in place just due to the subgrade prep and everything. Um, so you're looking to add an extra week of time where we have to keep that act, uh, bypass activated. And again, 
we were trying to when we were looking at this trying to keep that schedule as tight as possible where we had to divert and bypass the water around um, you know so we we're trying to trying to keep it within a week's time where we could go in there see the weather outlook for the next week say we got six days of dry dry weather we got a, a reasonable depth of water here that we know we can handle let's go in and get it you know when you start pushing it out two to three weeks after the year we've had I don't trust it right now I maybe maybe last year not right now I understand that. yep but I, I just I'm uncomfortable with the, the riprap head wall you know I'm, that's what I'm uncomfortable I'm, I'm for the box culvert and concrete set it and forget it under understood so you know, now you know where up. I'm coming yep. from. <laughs> okay so we've heard uh, from everyone to no look like you wanted to say something else I was just uh, sorry uh, just looking through our, our culvert summary file um, we have 313 culverts I've only been able to scroll through the first 75 but I've seen about 10 or 11 that have been double double barreled uh, circular pipes like this uh, I can get you a full number uh, after this if you'd like and That's any all. of those have concrete head wall or are they all uh, you know? some look like they have granite some are placed next to each other uh, some have granite some have riprap it, it's kind of a some have just field stone placed around it uh, a lot of these are a little bit older um, located on ledge road doral drive uh, it's yeah some look some look like they're just uh, granite curbstones so it looks like just material that might have been on site when they were installed can i make a comment funding yeah. can't be the only reason why you're doing this it's you want durability and funding just can't be the only reason well it's uh funding's a a, a huge component to it um i'm not saying that a, a concrete box culvert that's 11 feet in the ground isn't a, a better solution uh, but you are talking about two and a half times more on the cost let alone the ledge that has to be replaced and the water main that has to get okay. relocated 14 feet in the You're ground only stretching it out you talked about doing blasting removing mm -hmm. ledge in some of the estimates that I heard of Trevor talk was a, a week, two weeks, that's not the end of the world. That, that's with the stream and the bypass fully running 24 hours a day in addition to the four weeks that it's already going to be done. So you're looking at six, seven weeks of the pumps running 24 hours a day to maintain with that flow. And if we encounter any issues or anything goes awry while we have that staged and open uh, and we have a hurricane that comes through, that's going to overtop that location. Any work that is open or done would be uh, kind of destroy the work that we'd be doing. And that's why if it's something that may not be able, we don't have the funding to go forward with it as is. So we'd have to go get more funding and then we'd have to readdress it uh, when we came back. But you said th th two or three months, nothing was done on the job because weather conditions or whatever it was. But you knew what your end game was two or three months ago. Meaning what you were gonna do there. Uh, right, so uh, they did mobilize on July 5th. Uh, they did set in those bypass. Uh, Trevor can give you the dates for when that was done. Uh, but uh, the pump that they did bring in originally was not sized correctly. We've been waiting for dry weather or hopefully weather to go back into the summer conditions where it was lower. And that way they would be able to try to work with it and try to mobilize. That's why I think John had mentioned that there was no activity on the site for a couple of weeks at a time. Uh, was trying to look into that, that weather conditions, look for a pattern where we'd be able to even potentially bypass the work and then start it. Uh, and that's when, the, when they were in that process of just trying to set up the bypass and they were trying to set up that coffer dam. They ended up trying to use a steel plate. So once the ledge or the refusal was noted when they put in the bypass, uh, weeks later they then said, well, let's just get the coffer dam up and running, see if we can even handle the flow that is, because I believe in the month of July we had 14 inches of rain. Uh, so then they tried to do that with a steel plate, and the plate ricocheted off of like a, a foot or two into the ground, meaning that there was much uh, larger area of refusal or ledge in this location. And with that issue, that they were already four or five weeks in, so we're talking the early August. Since then, then we've been looking at it and trying to figure out different solutions. What can we do? That's where we're trying to work with our contractor on pricing. What would it be for ledge removal? Would they need to bring a machine on site? Do they have the machine? Would it be rental? And that's where we've started to encumber all these additional costs that would be change orders. Once we then evaluated that, we realized we don't have the funding for it. How can we actually get this project done this year once now they've already been over there mobilized and we've encountered something that was not shown on the plans correctly and move forward with it so that we, we can get the project done this year. 
this is why we came before you now with this change. So it wasn't something on July 5th, we knew exactly that there was ledge. All these things took a, a few days, a few weeks, and then once everything built up, we then took a, a week or so just to try to figure out what can we do or how do we do it? Can we find extra money uh, or how can we move forward with this? And that's how we've ended up coming before you today. And, and when was that first approved for the Vox COVID? I believe in 2020, September 2020. Three years ago? Yes. And no engineering was done to see what was site was. Site I was, was not here in 2020. I know they did borings no, I'm, I'm that are shown on the you. plan, but okay. I don't know what conversations were held with DPW and Weston Sampson uh, that I, made I them just, to go with that design or deviate or, or change from two culverts to one culvert from the MVP. I can only look at the records or what used to be on the plans and try to come up with how they ended up where they were. I just don't, I'm just, my concern is I don't want this to be good enough for these people. That's all. That's understandable. And so it is an improvement on what's there. You're right, it is not the, the 11 foot deep or seven by eight foot box culvert. Uh, so if you're looking just for the concrete and for something that's gonna last 60, 70 years, we think we're gonna get over 30 years from this and with general maintenance and making sure it's maintained, it should be longer. That's something where we can make sure that the riprap's always maintained, we can look for the blockage. And once we find the beavers, we go through the study and then we can address downstream overall the area is done. I don't know why the downstream area wasn't done first or how we ended up here. It's just, this is the project that we have and trying to move forward with it. Okay. So I, I'm sorry, I don't have all those answers. John. That's my, my, my question is, when the emergency fix was done, was a box cover, that box cover was approved for both ends, right? I believe there was originally an approval for two box covers, yes. Correct, that's what I thought. So we should have done the box cover at the emergency repair first. I, I, I wasn't here. I don't actually know how that failure happened and why that the storm division, stormwater division got mobilized into that. I can't answer as to what happened between the bidding of the project. I, let's I believe it was due to funding because when it was originally done, the, pri the cost was 700,000 or something. That wasn't the amount of money that was approved. But I think we have to why bound. Why wasn't a study done? Why? Sounds like you just yeah. It off of the guy before you. Yeah. So so yeah. There there is a need for a water study. I know Christine has mentioned it, and you you're talking about it having a, a broader study for that area. And I think that's really um, how you solve this problem long term. But let me just make sure that we keep focused on this. Hearing is for this culvert replacement and swapping out um, the original design of the box culvert or the box to the to the two pipes. And that's where we're at. That's the decision we have to make as a as a commission. If that's if that's what is acceptable. Can can I just add, David? Help me out here. I'm still the new guy. Does the current design, proposed design, two five inch pipes meet our conservation commission requirements? You mean under the regulations? Yeah. Yes. And then second question: Isn't that really our job here of this board? is to to advise and to determine if the proposed design meets our jurisdiction our conservation commission requirements right if, if it satisfies um, the wetlands protection act the local wetlands bylaw and associated rules and regulations yeah and and as a former civil engineer i appreciate all the discussion today but it's not our job is it to decide which culvert is better? Isn't it our job to determine if the request meets our bylaws? Yes. And and if in fact it's not the right design, but it does meet our requirements, that's not really our decision. I mean, we can influence that and we can advocate, but isn't our mission just to determine if the proposal meets our requirements? Uh, yes. I mean, it's really not the commission's job to design the project. That's true. Right. That's what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, if you if you want to have a question, come on up to the to the. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, Laura Merrill, uh, 7 Dunshire Drive, and I live across the street looking at the construction that's been sitting there. Um, my question here is now I, I hear the tone is that we're crunched for time, and if we don't make a decision tonight that um, we're going to have to come back to the Springtown meeting. Um, 
I know town meeting is in October. Do, is there a chance that we could get a um, special town meeting if we rallied together and, and tried to get that on the program for October? I, do we have enough days to get that done? I'm not aware of a way to do that. I know special town meetings are put together at times, but they're it's already... It's pretty frequent, um, almost every year. So um, I, I don't have that information. I, I don't want I to put them in here on the spot. I, I, th I think the warrant is closed for the October town meeting. Yeah. It's but but if there was a special meeting, it could. it's possible that that could happen. Um, it exactly. may not be the same day. It may be a month later or something. Exactly. And is there a ta timetable for how late you could start this project in the year that all of a sudden it's just too late? And I don't know if that, you know, we're, we are looking up at, at the next season. So I guess that would question yeah. me to the gentleman who's standing behind me. Thank you. Okay. The short-term fix is to get rid of the beaver dams. That should be done independent of any other discussion about culverts. And that can be, I've never heard, incidentally, I've never heard of a beaver dam moving, as somebody meant. Beaver dams are built, they don't like them, they go build another one. But they don't tear down the one they built. So we ought to be able to find the beaver dam that's causing the backup. And that should be done independent of moving ahead with this project. Trevor? So schedule is a constraint. Um, we cannot pave pretty much after November November 15th, all asphalt plants shut down at pretty much around that date. So if we don't get moving on this soon enough, uh, even if they do start early November, you'll still see that whole uh, work site sectioned off all winter long. Right. Um, and that's what we're trying to avoid. Um, for obviously plows and school buses during the winter. So, um, okay. yep. All right. So, oh, yeah, one more. Uh, excuse me. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the Conservation Commission. My name is Rodney Elliott, um, state representative that represents uh, North Jumpsford and the Westlands area. area. Uh, I I'm just here to offer, you know, my office support. I, I was not a state representative when the municipal vulnerability and preparedness grant was was not approved. However, if there are other opportunities, um, please let me know. As well as, um, you know, the residents did contact me. I did speak to the town manager uh, about this. I went out and and visited the site myself um, but when it comes to I guess I, I come before you to say if there's something that I can do with mass DOT relative to whether the culverts in North Chelmsford or Tingsboro we can you know I can work with um, with members of the legislature and and uh, mass DOT to, to get some action out there so just wanted to, to offer my assistance to to you Mr. Coons or, or, or the board on anything that I can run interference uh, with mass DOT. Thank you very much. We may be looking for that help. Uh, hey, with I suggest 3A. that be a high priority. A high priority. Yeah. Yeah. Is the culvert at yeah. Duffy's Auto Body. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. that is a high priority. That's the sticks and everything that were in there today that I saw, and the vortex going down. That's that's where mass DOT should go in there and pour it out. But but as as you know, John, Mass DOT notoriously I, I needs a little right. bit of encouragement <laughs> at times to <laughs> get on. So, well, thank you. <laughs> so um, one moment. So Tony, maybe you talk with Christine to make sure she connects with the representative. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Michelle Caputo, Stark Weather 19, Dunshire Drive, back again. Um, so, like my part of the street was emergency f emergency fixed because there was a gas line that was visible. That's why there was an emergency, just in case anyone missed that. Um, but um, like my part of the street is paved over and there's a hole in the other part of the street. But I'm hearing, well, if we don't get this done by this date, if we don't do this, if we don't do that, it's the spring anyways. So if you're making a decision based on well, we're not going to be able to get it done because we're now running into time constraints and money constraints and whatever else, then let's not just push through the make-do plan if we're really going to have to wait until the spring. 
if you can close the hole in the road, that'd be pretty awesome. I'm sure most of the neighbors would prefer not to have a big hole in the road. Personally, I think that's a big, huge safety hazard. If nothing else, emergency vehicles can't come around the circle. They have to turn around or whatever. And I've seen emergency vehicles in my neighborhood before. One's visited my house before. So, you know, like I get that. But if the answer is, well, when it comes down to it after this and the study and the that and the other thing, we're not actually gonna get it done, then maybe we need to have another conversation or something that says we'd really like it to be properly done and it's not gonna happen no matter what. Because I don't wanna just do the make do that we have at our end, which we thought we were getting a cul the big box culvert too. And I don't know if that means that since they did the emergency repair, we're never going to get that done because now we've got 30 years worth of that. I don't think it'll last 30 years. But if it means let's wait, but we're going to wait anyways while we're waiting for asphalt because it doesn't come out after no November 15th, I think he said, and all those other things. I'm not saying don't do the thing, but is there something that they could do to temporarily fill it, close it, make it and then have it properly done in the spring mm -hmm. where the neighbors are safe they're not worried about their kids falling into the brook and climbing around fences and whatever then personally as the lady that doesn't live next to that construction site I say wait <laughs> but if you say no we can get this all done and we're not going to get the money that's just the facts Jack then get it done that's kind of where I'm feeling on that I don't know how you guys feel about that but that's kind of my thought on the subject Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I just wanted one point of clarification. So uh, the timing for the fall window is if this was approved, so that way we could get it done. If the two five-foot pipes were not approved, we then need to go get funding, which is why it would then get delayed until, until, until we were able to get those funds to move forward with the project. It's not if this were to get approved, then then we'd have to wait for funding, since we would then have the allocated funds that were set for this project to get this section done and completed this year. So though there are two independent factors on timing before to get it, try to get it done this season versus getting funding to then have to come back to, to try to, to, to do the box culvert uh, if it's not approved as is. And, and Tony, you, you're fairly confident if you can start construction early October is the date you gave. Um, you're fairly confident you can close the street up and satisfy the neighborhood concerns. Yes, I believe so. Because uh, we need a little luck with weather, but as long as we get four days, five days of of no rain, right. uh, that's something that we should be able to get it done this year uh, with the with the proposal of the two five foot pipes. Um, you say one thing. You know, I I think the last thing you want um, is for the site to potentially go through the winter like this, because because if nothing is done, one if the site were to freeze you'd not only have all the problems out there right now but they'd be five times worse at least because because if all that surface water to fr were to freeze and we get say a, a heavy rainstorm um, after that which is certainly possible we don't know obviously how mild or severe this winter will be there will be no place for that water to go because the ground will be frozen the surface water to be frozen and 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 the and which will make this flooding look like a picnic really so i i think that as, that really is a legitimate concern not to leave this site like this all winter long okay oh another one i'm the lady that lives next to what's going on terry kelly 38 dunchai drive i just want this fixed the right way i don't want a quick fix i've been there for 46 years now I want my property to maintain its value. Uh, the little eight, 10 foot wide brook this morning was 40 to 50 feet wide. My sister-in-law, with, with the rain tomorrow across the street, she's gonna have water in her house. It just, with the, I understand the whole thing and everything. You're not seeing the beaver dams because they're under the water right now. The water is so high, the beaver dams are underneath the water. That's why if they went over with their drone or whatever, they didn't see any beaver dams today. They're underneath. This has been going on since I've lived there. And we've, it's been fine. But right now, the way that street is, I don't want a quick fix. 
I want something that's going to be done right. The cement culvert was the way it was going to be the whole time. And when they got out there, they realized, I think the job was a little more than what they expected. And that's why they said, we need to do something different. So whatever you decide to do, I want it done right. I want it to look back the way it did before. I want you to be able to go out and fix the beavers so that we don't go up with this. So it's going to rain tonight. I'm afraid to get up tomorrow morning and see what's going what's to happen. So that's all I say, and thank you. Mr. Elliott, whatever you can do for us, please, we would appreciate it. We've been trying to get the state to fix those culverts down there for years, and nothing's happened. So that's where we have to go first. This has to get done, but we also need the whole beaver problem to go away. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think we're at a point. Do we close the hearing? Yeah. Makes sense. Make motion to close the hearing. We have all the information. Oh, point. Yep. Sure. John Kelly, John Kelly, duty at Dunshire Drive. So J.J. Phelan abandoned us two months ago. They haven't been back. They went to another job and I believe Lincoln, and they just came to the site this past week, took, all their, took a lot of their equipment, their dry, and they're now working on a culvert under the same water conditions in Tewksbury. They didn't come back in the, after the 4th of July. They didn't come back at all. They promised and they were going to come back this Monday. They will not be there Monday. I'll bet you even money. I'll bet you two to one. I have no way, there's no way we can prove that J.J. Phelan is going to come up even this month. We may not see them until October anyhow, until their problem is solved in Tewksbury. Keep that in mind. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Trevor. So uh, I've been talking to J.J. Phelan for a while about this change and notifying them how if this gets approved, we need to make sure it happens this fall. And if it does get approved, you know, he, he knows he's going to turn around a, a full price for me as soon as he can, and then we'll get a mope date set up. So uh, I've been in constant, constant talks with him, even just called him, got off the phone with him earlier today. So um, I, I do firmly believe that they will get it done. Just to, for clarity, that's the subcontractor that, that, that that's the contractor. Yep, yep. So, yeah, the contract. Okay, so I think we're at a point where we. I guess I make a motion that we close the hearing, Mr. Chairman. Okay, Chris makes the motion. Do we hear a second? Second. Second from Dave. All all in favor of closing the hearing? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Okay. All in favor to close the hearing. Now, how do we want to approach this? What's uh, <laughs> That I have an opinion with a caveat that I'm the new guy still. You can't after say eight that. Months, you can't I'm going to say that until I get say a year. That I'm going to say that until I get a year in. Since no, you've got no, what, no. 32 now? No, 33? No. Um, it seems to me that a lot of these questions are are not really our commissions to answer. Does the com com company, sorry, does the town want to spend more money is one question. I can't answer that. Second, what's best for the residents? Residents have, some say go, some say stop. I mean, I'd like a resident poll because I think it, this is one of those gray areas. And thirdly, um, I think this meets our regulations. And I think we're being asked whether this meets our regulations, not does this project meet those three criteria of budget, schedule, and neighborhood interest. So. I'm not quite sure, reason I said new guy, I'm not quite sure how, what the commission does in this case, um, we where there's big we, questions. We vote that point that you just made. Does it meet our regs? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. So that being said, is there any other, before we go there, um, is there any other alley, uh, is there any other way that the, the folks that have issues can work t within the town? like with DPW or with somebody else to, to try to alter this and change the direction of the project independent of what we vote here. Is that well, at least they've got a DPW director from North Johnson. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, I don't think they've had that before. Yeah, I, hmm? I, I, I guess I'm just... Oh, a long time I, ago. Yeah, it, you're it, right. It's that's sort right. of like we're, we're, you know, kicking the can Putting down, but, but that's that's our, you know, we're trying to, we're trying to keep, keep this limited to what we're 
to your point, to what our jurisdiction is. And the question there is, is does this meet our regulations? And that's where, that's where we're at. I, I think we, the board is using this as the residents' platform. They have a, no other way of expressing what's yeah. got done tonight. And I've probably taken more than I should have on this side of this. But we always seem to throw our two cents in every project that we think it should. If we don't know, yep. we'll have a peer review. Yep. We just can't limit it to what our, ju our jurisdiction is either. Well, well, are you suggesting that our that this doesn't meet, or that we should ask more questions, technical questions? Mm -hmm. uh, we, we just seems that the problems when the ball was dropped three years ago. Exactly. And, 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 and there's no easy way to rectify that. Yeah. That's we right. can't go back three years. Right. That's 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 the problem that we have. Well, we would have been in the same position three years. Ex expert opinion would have said. Well, we made the well, decision. Well, the, the decision at that time it was a, it was with a box. It was a, with a box culvert. We would have made the same decision back yep. then. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I'm not going to vote for it. I, I think the box culvert's the better way to go. It should have been box culvert. I'm not. I'm, what are you going to you know, do with the, What are you going to do with You're going to help these guys out in the winter time. I think it's the better choice. I mean, I, I'm not sure. No, you're going to help these guys out in the winter time well, when it's an open hole. They're welcome to come and talk to us about it. We'll give them a forum. No, but we're not DPW, Chris. I mean, what about what about the flooding being many times worse in a bad winter storm? I mean, is, it, is that is delaying going to create a bigger problem for our I, I don't. I just citizens? don't like. I don't like the solution of it. So I'm just not comfortable with it. So that's how I'm going. I mean, you know, I'm here. I look at it. We're make, trying to make a decision what's best for the the town, common good, and I don't like it. So this yeah, but we're, Chris, matter. we're making a conservation decision. I know. We're I not know. making an economic I know, decision. I know. I know. I happen I know. to agree with you that I, I think box culverts are a better way to go. Yeah. And I, I think this I, should have been designed better. I'm going to guess Tony and, and Trevor would say the same thing. That's right. the better better right. solution. But they're in a they're in a in a quantity. You know, they're in a pickle. So oh, yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah. And they're doing the best they can. Yep. And, and yep. I, honestly, I'm not critical of, of anything they're doing today. Yep. And I have a lot of respect for our DPW. Yep. Yep. They're, they're a really good crew. Any other discussion or any motions? Or I move the question. Let's vote on it. Okay. What's the motion? To, to approve the, to, to approve the approve. request of the DPW to... Uh, <laughs> Amend the conditions of 129-0892 for 19 to 20 Dunshire Drive. Oh, it's not 19. I'm sorry. Whatever the right address is. I apologize. The Dunshire Drive upper uh, yeah. culvert. Okay. So moved by Dave. Second. Second. Second by Bill. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Opposed. So we have three in favor and uh, four in favor and three opposed. So I guess that passes and uh, make a uh, sign the sign the amendment. And uh, are there any special order conditions? We didn't vote on that. We didn't say anything. Uh, I, I would say it's just referencing the the plans. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make another motion. I might. Yes, go ahead. I move that we direct the DPW to report to us on a weekly basis the status of locating and removing the beaver dams. And you can you can notify Mr. Kuntz, our agent. I think that's a thing that has to be done immediately, and it will not solve the problem, but certainly ameliorate the problem. That's my motion. I, I would um, include if anybody in the audience that wants to help the DPW, please notify Tony, I guess, or Trevor. Um, and uh, because, you know, often the people in the neighborhood know where to look. If you did it through our stormwater division, uh, stormwater. Rob Wood and Christine, uh, Courtney Thompson. Okay, Rob, Rob Wood is the Rob Wood is the new superintendent, yes. Because I think, I think that's a good, so that's the motion, uh, Dave, any second? That's to report to us weekly. Second. Who was that? Yeah. Peter. Peter yeah. second. All, all in favor of that direction? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. No, no. Nope. Not opposed. Okay. All, all in favor. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Uh, that's, this discussion's closed. Everybody, thank you very much for your attendance and your interest and your comments and your inputs. Okay.
Um, just for the public, as you're leaving, we have to keep the door open, and we have to we have more business to do. So um, if you're talking outside the room, we really hear you. So please keep moving, <laughs> so that we can keep our door open and meet our legal requirements of an open door meeting. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. Thanks. Okay. Ready to take a breath? Okay. Let's go to the next item uh, issue on the on the uh, agenda: request for determination of applicability. Robert and Lisa Napolitano, 221 Littleton Road. Uh, Bruce Ringwall from Goldsmith Press and Ringwall is here representing the applicant, and we have a a notice. Mr. Chair, a legal notice pursuant to the provisions of Massachusetts Wetlands Protection Act, Mass General Laws, Chapter 131, Section 40, and the Chelmsford Wetlands Bylaw, Chapter 187. The Chelmsford Conservation Commission will conduct a public hearing in Room 204 in the town offices here at 50 Villica Road on Tuesday, September 12, 2023. To consider the request for determination of applicability filed by the property owners Rob and Lisa Napolitano for proposed work within 100 foot buffer zone to bordering vegetated wetlands at 221 Littleton Road, further identified as Assessor's Map 91 slash Block 378, Lot 6. Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, and uh, we have a representative from the applicant. Hello, Bruce. Good evening. Dave, if you could bring the plan up. So we were here a couple of weeks ago. Um, the commission requested that we provide you with a uh, request for determination of applicability relative to um, our proposal to help protect against a, a potential spill uh, from parking uh, virtually empty oil, three oil delivery trucks on the west side of the existing building on the existing pavement. Again, no new proposed impervious areas are being proposed here. Where you see uh, the dashed arrows on the plan, they indicate the direction of flow, surface flow, of how water would flow um, or how a spill would flow. And that would be from the west to the northeast. Um, there is an existing bituminous berm that runs about halfway down the west side of the building along the east side of that existing pavement. We have proposed to extend that with a Cape Cod bituminous berm uh, to the end of the building and then west along the end of the existing paved area. We also have noted on the plan that the uh, any cracks in the pavement to be uh, filled uh, and sealed and that uh, this would provide for uh, any spill within that area. Again, there would be no <coughs> delivery vehicles parked on the right hand side. We've added a note to the plan of that nature. Um, Mr. Kunz and I met on site and we talked about these particular um, conditions and such on the site. Um, we also are talking about the fact that these trucks are trucks that are licensed through Mass DOT and through the fire marshal and through your fire department. Uh, the possibilities of a spill out of the truck are fairly limited of, the, of oil and again they are mostly empty when they're on site. The trucks themselves having a seal, uh, a gasket or uh, um, a radiator leak or something of that nature, um, it's probably less than the average car parked in the condominium uh, next door. That being because this gentleman is making deliveries to your homes and other people's homes and he doesn't want to be leaving marks from his truck when he's at anybody's house as well. This proposal is not a drainage proposal. It is a proposal to stop any type of leaks. Each of the trucks has a spill kit. The facility itself has other uh, backup spill kits within it. What we have proposed in the uh, very simple uh, long-term operation and maintenance plan that we've provided a simple one page tells you who everybody is and the backside tells us um, about the site and the bottom of the maintenance requirements we're suggesting that there be regularly inspections so what's regularly inspections 
Rob is the driver of these vehicles. He's going to be coming out of the building. He walks around his truck and he gets in his truck and he's checking the pavement underneath. If there is any kind of spill or leak, he has the training and the spill kit to do the cleanup. As well, this berm is also going to collect sediment runoff across this. In the wintertime, we're tracking sand onto the site and he's going to have to be maintaining that and cleaning that. That is part of this uh, O&M that we've put forth before you this evening as well. Pick, clean those up and then to remove the materials appropriately under the standards of the Commonwealth of Rules and Regulations and 310 CMR 30, which is hazardous um, materials cleanup. Lastly, Dave and I spoke about the need. Dave suggested there might be a need to do this every three years um, because of the use issue. To that end, I would suggest, and I suggested to Dave, and I have a uh, draft that I can hand out. Um, I don't have it prepared by the attorney yet, but basically it would be a one-page document that explains the site and what's been done here or what's proposed to be done here to the effect that it would say that the owner has agreed to seal the cracks in the western pavement portion and install Cape Cod bituminous berm along the northern and western edges of said pavement. The owner operator of the business has agreed to regularly inspect the paved areas for sediment buildup and for spills. The owner operator will collect any sediment debris or spill response materials and properly dispose of for local, state, and federal requirements. Any sediment debris to be contained must be evaluated in accordance with the hazardous waste regulations 310 3 CMR 30 and handled as hazardous waste. Based on those above, the Chelmsford Conservation Commission hopefully, would issue a determination of applicability DEP Form 2 for the finding of a negative 3 determination for the above property to permit the change in use allowing the petroleum delivery trucks to park empty or nearly empty on the pavement west side of the building. That document would then be recorded at the Registry of Deeds, so the use issue would be permanent for this owner, for this tenant, for this use. And the it addresses the maintenance, which was in the O&M, but it has it at the Registry of Deeds as well. I would like to request that w the owner has gone out and he's found a pavement company that can start at your blessing. And not until, because this is why we're here for the RDA. And upon getting that pavement changed, that he's able to move the vehicles back in. And prior to that time, we would have this document prepared so that the David can review it to make sure it says what I've just said and that uh, it can be recorded at the Registry of Deeds. Thank you. I turn it over to you. For Thank questions. you, Bruce. David, do you have any more? Um, I, I, yes. So, um, so, so I, um, I, only, I only just saw the O&M plan um, this afternoon, late this afternoon, um, busy, busy doing other things. I mean, it's, it, it's pretty simple. But I, I, I actually like to keep the hearing open. I, I, I'd like to just review this a little bit more. Um, I, you know, I certainly like what Bruce is proposing. I'm, I'm thinking maybe, maybe then the O&M plan could be attached as an exhibit to that. That gets that gets. But it's spelled out as the steps so, in here. Okay. Well, I'm, again, I haven't had, had a chance to see that and review it. I, I think I'd like something in there that that permanently limits the number of trucks to three. We can do that. Which is, so, so you know, I, again, I'd, I'd like to take a little bit more time to think about it, and maybe members of the commission would like to do that uh, as well, and send me suggestions. Um, there, the, the the owners have requested um, to to be in the meantime to uh, allow for the commission to allow the trucks to come back, um, and I have spoken to that a little bit with Carl. I, I I think if if the commission is inclined to approve this as a negative determination. I, I think that, um, that that that's something the commission could allow as soon as the berm is is put in place, which it sounds like that's ready to go anytime. As soon as we get so, the okay to do it, we'll call them up. So um, that's kind of what I'm suggesting is that the, the, the hearing be kept open, but in, but in the meantime that the berm then be put in and the trucks can be brought back again if, if the commission is otherwise inclined to approve this. Okay, 
Thank you. Any John? What do you? No, I'm good with it. Yep. Yep. Good. Okay. Peter. Um, David, I'm good with it. I would suggest, and if you need help, shout out that this O and M plan includes a couple of the other things that I just heard tonight. Uh, for example, I heard daily inspections, which sounds great. That's, That's what I would do if it were my truck. But I would put that in the plan. The plan <coughs> says uh, some other words, not daily. You, I know you haven't seen this yet. Um, well, e e email me your suggestions. I'll do that. But but I think you know everything you're saying makes sense to me. Well, I'm good. Yes, Dave. Will the trucks only be stored on the asphalt? That is correct, sir. That's stipulated. Yes, sir. Uh, that can be. I mean, that's a zoning issue anyway. It's a zoning violation not to store them on the pavement. So. I'm sorry? It's a zoning violation not to store them okay. on the pavement. But that I can want to certainly make sure be explicitly. It's easy if there is a it's it's What it says is what we're cleanup. proposing to do. Um, yep. The number of trucks I heard is going to be limited to three? That is correct. Okay. And as I understand it, there is no oil in the truck. That is correct. None or just residue? Residue. Residue. To have anything more than residue, do you need a separate license? No, they they can. We're putting none in there because they uh, that's they a business, deliver that, that's each a day. That's a business that's reason. A business reason. But could you fill the truck up and store it there? Not if you give, don't give us permission to. Okay, it's, it doesn't <laughs> fall into some other state line. That is correct. Right. Okay. So you're saying only empty trucks? Only empty trucks, right? Okay. If that's the understanding of everybody. That's correct, and that's the business model. Yeah, okay. That's it. Mark? You good? You, you all set, Dave? Yep. Uh, I, I know in a perfect world you're going to come back there with nothing in the bottom of the truck. Suppose you don't sell all of your product. Are you going to come back with the rest of it in the truck, or are you going to dump it somewhere before you get there? <laughs> he, he goes by his orders. If oh, he yeah. has so many orders, then he goes and fills up that much oil and then goes and delivers that much oil, sir. You don't see that scenario happening when he comes back with 100 gallons of fuel oil in the truck. Don't see that happening. I'm good. Chris? Yeah, I'm ready to approve, Carl. Okay. So um, if I may address yeah. the initial piece on there. Um, all of the things that I talked about are on here. I did not use the word daily because daily, in my mind, is seven days a week. Yeah, that's a good point. And so I put regularly. Um, it's open for interpretation. He knows what he's up against. He's going to be taking care of the place. I, I, Business days. I think the, um, the state rigs on the trucks are more than what we're looking for. So. Yeah. Well, just say spill inspection every time before use of a truck they do that I, in a circle check anyway yeah. okay yeah. okay you know, so um, I think what I'm hearing then is that we would be approving this with a negative determination um, uh, but the open um, keeping it open until you get to review the uh, uh, the O&M plan but in the meantime I feel pretty comfortable, I think what I heard from everybody here, that we'd be comfortable with giving him the signal to go ahead and do the, the berm paving and the uh, uh, and to move the trucks in once the berm pavement pavement is completed. Right. Am, am I right? Yep. Yeah. So right. we're not gonna approve it tonight, but we're pretty confident we will at the next meeting, which we would do this at the next meeting. Um, I see somebody from the audience wants to talk. We've had our open meeting uh, posted, so let's um, let's listen to um, the, uh, the the public. Hi, I'm Ruth Luna, 10 Carter Drive. I just wanted to add that I think what David is proposing is good because since it is an RDA and it sounds like you're issuing a negative determination, you can't by law put any conditions on it. It all has to be spelled out in place because a negative determination, you're in essence saying you don't have jurisdiction. And so it's wise to go this route and make sure everything is spelled out and written exactly what you want. And then on that piece of document, you can issue the negative determination. So and, and something will be recorded at the register to right. memorialize. Yeah. And so I, I, I agree with what David was proposing. Just wanted to say that. Thank you for reinforcing our approach. <laughs> 
Okay. I will just say that on the form under the negative three, it has with conditions, and your conditions would be such. Yeah, okay. Okay, so we all okay with that? We can nod, I guess, with that. Uh, so I'll make a motion, then we uh, okay. continue um, yeah. to our next meeting of September 26th. I request that in that continuance, you add that he may pave do the do the work because I yep. it's the first time I've done work ahead of an RDA approval so I just wanted to be yes. in the note in minutes please as amended and as you can bring the trucks back too. and then so he can the bring the trucks back, back the after the after yeah. the pavements completed yeah. so thank you very much so we have a motion and from Chris we have a second from John all in favor aye. 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 aye any opposed no okay so so we'll see you at one more meeting I guess so <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you for your time Thank you to the applicant. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Uh, next on the agenda, we are looking at a uh, notice of intent for 10 Hildreth Street. David Cowell, Hancock Associates, representing the applicant. And we do have a notice, I think, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, let me bring it up. One moment, please. I don't know what happened to... Um no, that's the old, that's the old one. Here, Chris, you want to read it from here? Sure. Uh, Mr. Chair, legal notice. Pursuant to the provisions of Massachusetts Wetlands Protection Act, Mass General Laws, Chapter 131, Section 40, and the Chelmsford Wetlands Bylaw, Chapter 187, the Chelmsford Conservation Commission will conduct a public hearing in Room 204 of the town offices on Tuesday, September 12, to consider the notice of intent filed by Property Possible, Inc. on behalf of property owner Kimberly A. Kelly Oberhauser Living Trust for proposed work within bordering land subject to flooding and 100-foot buffer zone to bordering vegetated wetlands at 10 Hildreth Street, further identified as Assessor's Map 74 slash Block 324, Lot 12. Yep. Okay, the applicant. Uh, Outstanding. Thank you, guys. Um, uh, Welcome, Commission. Welcome, members of the public. My name is David Cowell. I'm a senior wetland scientist and wet, uh, wildlife biologist with Hancock Associates here on behalf of the applicant. Um, before I begin, I did want to recognize some members of our project team that are with me here tonight. Um, Brian Goudreau is a, a senior associate project manager and civil engineer on the project. We do have John Riley in, in attendance tonight. John Riley is an assistant uh, engineer who's been on the design team. And we have uh, representation from um, our, our client. Uh, we have uh, Michael Lefevre, um with possible or, or property possible. Um, we uh, submitted a notice of intent uh, and request to permit a uh, five lot subdivision with five residential houses at 10 Hildreth Street. Uh, 10 Hildreth Street, there's two lots here. There's, there's uh, with the postal address, 10 Hildreth is lot 12. And there's a rectangular undeveloped lot um, to the north that's lot 10. Um, these combined lots are, are abutting and under common ownership um, that we're proposing to, to create the subdivision. Um, I'll start with uh, existing conditions in wetland resource areas and um, um, environmental constraints on the lot. Uh, we started with a wetland delineation. There are um, some wetlands out here associated with a wetland complex and a perennial stream. So uh, I had field delineated uh, median high water associated with the, the stream itself as it projects the, the inner 100 foot riparian and 200 foot riverfront onto the property. Um, there's boring vegetated wetland out there that I field delineated that um, uh, projects the, um, the local setback zone in the 100 foot buffer zone. And the third resource area we have out there is bordering land subject to flooding, which is, uh, um, if some of you are familiar, it's a floodplain elevation that isn't field delineated. It's determined based on um, a sur elevational survey of the lot to determine where that, that floodplain elevation is. Um, in efforts to avoid, minimize, and mitigate for wetland impacts, we first uh, worked on uh, avoidance. Um, we've been able to keep our development entirely outside of the 200-foot riverfront area, so we haven't triggered any uh, riverfront um, regulations. We, are, um, we have some minimal proposed work in the 100-foot buffer zone, but we, we've respected the, um, the local setback, the no-build zone. 
Um, but we do have some proposed work in bordering land subject to flooding. And, and the work in bordering land subject to flooding um, has uh, a couple of performance standards associated with it. One is that you can't, for any volumetric fill within the 100 foot flood plain, you would need to provide no less than one to one volumetric flood uh, capacity on the site elsewhere that ties in hydrologically to the same 100 year flood plain that we have. And, and we're offering that. Um, the other one is that it's, it's also based on incremental elevations and incremental grades. So at each elevation between, say, 167 and 168, you need to provide that fill for, for each grade. And, and we've done that as well. Um, I wish I had a pointer where I could point out where the, because the, I, I don't want to leave out the members of the public if I were to come to that screen. Um, can I come around or? Sure. The screen right. behind you. Everybody still hear me? Are we still concerned about uh, members of the public? This, uh, the, the color if coordinated I, lines. I'm not sure that you can, they can hear online. Um, That's what I'm, I was concerned. Yeah, I so I think if you stay, if you stay there. I think he can carry the microphone. Oh, okay. Yeah, you can take John's. You can take John's. We'll keep John quiet. <laughs> All right, got some little lead here. All right, for the public. This is karaoke. Okay. All right, I've got, I've got this. This. Here we go. All right. So, so these lines here, um, the riverfront, the outer riverfront area is the blue line. Uh, this comes off of uh, um, mean annual high water associated with the stream on the far end of the property. But our, our scope of work is uh, this house, one of the five houses is proposed, this blue line demarcates the floodplain elevation. Um, so what we've done is if you scroll a little bit further north, and I don't know if it's on this plan, our next plan is the grading and grading plan. This area here is called out as the area of compensatory storage uh, and, and compensatory replacement of the flood storage there. Um, th those are the wetlands and those are the wetlands, uh, um, uh, our impacts and in, in, in what we propose. Of, of concern out here, we also have mapped rare species habitat. This is a mapped habitat for um, two species of rare turtle for which we've been coordinating with natural heritage. We submitted a simple MESA review application um, about a year ago uh, when we, we initiated work in this project and it was suspended and they, they initiated a review of this. Um, we contacted uh, the review biologist is Lauren Glorioso. Um, we contacted her and reinitiated the MISA review with some middle of the notice of intent. She said that she would initiate the 30 day reveal period. What they have asked us to do um, right now is do a wildlife habitat study, which we are uh, nearly done with. We've done the field uh, mapping of wildlife habitat and we've put it to paper. And right now, uh, I'd say by the end of this week, I'd anticipate that we would have a quantitative analysis of work within these different um, um, habitats that are on the site. Is, is we your firm? Yes, Hancock Associates. Yep, Hancock Associates will will, will produce this. Um, with this hearing, I, 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 we we don't under, we understand that this won't close tonight. There's an opening hearing that there will be some additional information through the, the the permitting process as we get there. I believe we open with planning board tomorrow night, and we we have some other. Um, um, boards to go through. So where we stand with natural heritage right now is they've asked for the wildlife habitat evaluation. We're very happy to provide a copy of that uh, once we release it to natural heritage. And I imagine, um, I think by email correspondence, you had said that uh, you had a civil engineer that you wanted to look at maybe stormwater and BLSF counts. Uh, uh, the DPW is reviewing stormwater for this project. Okay. And yes, right. uh, Brian knows a yep. um, uh, an outside firm has been hired to uh, review compliance with the performance standards for the bordering land subject to flooding. Right. Yep. Very good. So, um, so that's where we stand. Uh, I do have the civil engineers here. Do you want to speak a bit, Brian, yeah. about the project components? Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Uh, so for the record, Brian Goodrow with Hancock Associates. Uh, just a quick point of clarification. This is a six lot subdivision, not a five lot subdivision. Oh, excuse me. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I just want to go over briefly kind of our, our overall engineering and design of the subdivision. So six lot subdivision with a private roadway um, off of Hildreth Street. Generally speaking, um, topographically falls from Hildreth down towards Beaverbrook in the back. Um, and what we've done with our uh, intent of the grading is to mirror existing conditions. 
Um, so generally speaking, the roadway slopes away from Hildreth and everything kind of collects uh, towards that lower portion. David spoke about our BLSF impacts and uh, the primary driver for that is uh, lot four where our stormwater management is, is located. Uh, so for the scheme of stormwater management, um, first we went out there and we, we uh, conducted deep, uh, deep hole observation test pits to understand uh, soil texture as well as groundwater elevations. Um, soil is very sandy out here and groundwater is relatively deep from eight to 10 feet across the site. So with that, we were able to, to look at proposed development and design a treatment train uh, to roughly mirror what, what happens in the existing condition. So there's a couple of different points of analysis, one being the isolated wetland um, located by lots six and five, kind of to the southern property line. It's the bottom of the page, if you will. And then the secondary analysis point would be actually the brook. Um, down in the back, the southeastern uh, portion of the property. So our, our treatment train is, the roadway is collected by catch basins with deep sumps and hoods. Uh, it is then passed through a hydrodynamic separator for pretreatment and then is discharged to an infiltration basin. Um, so that will provide the TSS removal, the basin uh, provides the phosphorus removal that's locally required. Um, and also uh, provides recharge um, to approximate the existing condition. Now, for the compensatory storage analysis, <coughs> for the, the area that we're grading uh, within BLSF, we've earmarked an area to the east to essentially regrade. Uh, it's, it's beyond the end of the roadway. We're basically recontouring that area to provide the same amount of volume that we're filling on lots five and six. Um, additionally, the, the project will be serviced by municipal water and gas, and there is an existing sewer connection for the house. That existing sewer connection will be utilized for one building, um, much as it is right now, and the remainder of the lots will be on private septic. Now, Dave spoke about additional permitting that's being required. We open planning board tomorrow. Planning board is a definitive subdivision and a special permit with the aquifer protection. Um, we're also going to be before the Board of Health for Title V septic design approval, but also we fall within the groundwater protection zone. At the very beginning of the meeting, you talked about a joint uh, committee. Uh, we're going to be one of the first projects that's actually conducting a hydrogeologic study. Um, it's in process right now. Monitoring wells have been sunk. We've been talking to Chelmsford Water Department about their concerns. We've read through their <laughs> SOP, so we're, we're working through that process right now. Uh, and then a, a, a final stop would be Zoning Board of Appeals for work within the floodplain district, um, that BLSF, <coughs> compensatory storage. Um, I mean, that's kind of the, the high-level summary of, of what we have going on out here. Uh, as Dave indicated, it is our first meeting. I, I would imagine we're going to receive some good feedback this evening. Hopefully, we'll be able to answer questions. And if not, um, we'll be back in two weeks uh, with more information. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, David, do you have uh, comments you want to sure. start us with? Um, so I, kn I know there's a, a, a current ORED on this property. Sure. So what, what were the resource areas that uh, that covered? Uh, so it would be BLSF, Riverfront, and BBW. Oh, oh all of that was in that ORED? Correct. Uh, okay. So it's all the resource areas that are out there. Okay, um, but I think you said this is an isolated, did you say this is an isolated wetland? It's an isolated feature, but it, is it not no, BBW? Sorry, forgive me. It's I might be mis mis mischaracterizing. That's okay. It, it is not a non-jurisdictional isolated. It's a, a bordering vegetated wetland. Okay. It, it is hydrologically connected to the wetlands that are further south from there. What we did, this is off-property forested uh, wetland um, as it broadcasts the buffer zone onto our lot. So mm -hmm. it, it does have the associated buffer zones to it. None of that wetland occurs on our lot, but we've located as it projects buffer zones and setbacks. Did you have, have you, it, does, did you look at whether that might be a vernal pool or not? 
I did not see any. It's it, again, it's BVW and not isolated, and there is no standing water that would have capacity to to retain water for six to eight weeks to allow vernal pool obligate amphibians and uh, invertebrates to complete their life cycle. So I didn't see any vernal pool habitat. Okay, so I, I think that's something I'd like to take uh, a look at. Sure. So see see if I concur with that. Um, the. Uh, I, I guess I'd just like to make the comment that um, the the compensatory flood storage area is being proposed for the AT&T easement, correct? Yep. As, as this commission well knows, <laughs> that can be a very lengthy process. Right. Uh, there's There's been another notice of intent, actually the town is the applicant, where um, the town is asking National Grid to do the exact same thing. It's probably been a good year and a half. Uh, without getting an answer on that, so I think I think one, one 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 of the issues that the commission needs to decide is, do you want to keep the hearing open pending getting an answer from uh, National Grid? Which again, that's a good question. Is good National question. Grid uh, is it their easement, their right of way? Uh, yes. So the compensatory storage falls within National Grid easement. We have reached out to them. They have a, a specific process that you go through. Um, we've reached out to the point of contact for this region and have started that process. <laughs> Good for you. So, so <laughs> but it, it, you know, uh, <coughs> again, I think it, it, it may make sense for the commission to keep the hearing open until an answer, some kind of an answer is received from National Grid rather than close the hearing, making, making the approval uh, conditional upon that approval of National Grid only to then uh, them not getting it and only to have them come back. So that's something to think about. Um, the uh, With regard to the rare species issues, and um, I've already had pr a preliminary conversation with Mr. Cowell on this, I think, I, th I think you know, the commission does need to do some kind of peer review. Um, and I think, I think the commission has the most authority to do that under the, uh, the wetland bylaw, the Chelmsford wetland bylaw. Um, you know, what I think we need to think a little bit about uh, exactly what the scope of that review should be, whether it be just have the, the, the wildlife habitat evaluation that um, um, Han Hancock is, uh, is, is providing, um, or, or whether to have something, has, have, uh, something more extensive than that. My, my experience, with, it, with this sort of review is that, that uh, it, often the commission's consultant will say that they want to do their own review, which, which, which in, in this case might extend all the way look for looking for actual animals. You know, maybe, maybe doing some radio tracking. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know exactly what the scope would be. But, but it's also, in that case, it's also possible then that um, it would have it would have to wait until the appropriate time of year to do that. I mean, if if nesting turtles were were um, uh, going to be studied, then have have to wait until next year's um, nesting season, potentially. Again, this 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 is to be determined. But just want to you know put that on the commission's radar screen. Okay. Bye, Dave. Good night, Dave. So, um, all right. Why don't we just see what questions we have from the from the commission? Um, Chris, you want to start? Uh, I'm good at this at this point in time. I mean, I think it was a good overview presentation, and as I heard, we're going to have to continue this for you know further um, you know uh, hearing. But no, I'm good at the moment. Okay, Mark. Did you do any protesting? I'm sorry, what testing? Perk testing. Perk testing, yep. Engineering. Uh, so we have. Uh, we had Board of Health witness testing on all six lots um, to support septic system designs. And the perk tests were um, basically showed the fact that there was sand out there. There were anywhere from two minutes to five minutes an inch. Okay. Uh, I'm a, I'm a little concerned on that lot that's on the uh, southernmost that where you're going to put the uh, bleaching field. Would you think it'd be something you'd want to slow down on before letting it into the soil? The one I don't even I can't <coughs> see these lot numbers. I have no idea, but it's the one on the southern where the, the structure is. The septic would be in the front. 
And that's just outside of the uh, floodplain, is that correct? Yes, correct, right. Yeah. There's something you'd want to address by putting a, not letting it leach through so quickly? Because you said it was about two minutes. Uh, correct. So Title V mandates a, a greater separation of groundwater when you have a fast perk, right? So instead of a four foot, these are going to have a five foot offset. Okay. I've, I've known I've had to do it before where I put clay in the bottom to slow it down a little bit. But uh, that's, that's all I had right now. I'm just going over it. Okay, Bill. Uh, I'm fine at this point. I'm just, I'd be curious to see what National Grid has to say. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Peter? Uh, two or three questions. Tell me about trees. Do they all stay or do they all go? Uh, so generally speaking, we are showing a limit of work line and all trees within that limit of work line will be cut down. Um, the site is not completely forested uh, as it stands right now. Yeah. Thank you. And um, I want to echo David's comment about the wildlife because this is on our biomap two or three well, it's actually priority habitat. Well, it's more than that. It's, it's but actually it's, more than it's actually so it's jurisdictional more, habitat. Yeah, so it's, yeah, so it's more than, you're right, but it's more than just uh, endangered species. I would advocate a wildlife habitat for all wildlife because that brook is a wildlife corridor, not just for endangered species that natural heritage is concerned about, but all kinds of other critters that have managed you know, to survive in our highly developed suburb here. And um, um, so I would advocate for that when the time comes. And um, there's lots of septic questions that I think the water district will probably be looking at with the Board of Health. So we'll simply work with them uh, as we move forward. And um, that's all for now, thank you. John. Uh, we we walked this site. Yeah, yeah we walked this site. I was just going to say we did this site. Um, did. Is the Corvette still in the back in the bottom? Uh, I believe yeah. it is. Yes. Okay. We, yeah, we were there like two years ago. It's yeah, been a it while. Twenty twenty one. It was cool. Yeah. yeah, it was a cool day as I remember. And you did cool. some borings in that front area too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Where, so where you question the Vernal Pole area. They, I don't know if you were here. Were you here for that? These no. are duplexes. This no. is right for David. Did, did, did the commission yeah. question that? Yeah. I don't remember. I think we. No, not that. We, we lost our our deep memory guy for the <laughs> night. <laughs> not that particular question. Yeah. Okay. I, I don't remember. Well, I'm going to take a look at it. Yeah. So, David, how do you su suggest we move forward here? Uh, uh, well, first take. Um, Questions from the audience. Uh, <coughs> okay, yeah. So there are questions from the audience and concerns. Please give your name and address. I'm going to say almost good night. Uh, Paul Wood, 16 Hill Street. Um, I'm the closest resident down below here. Um, and what I've witnessed, I've lived there 30 years. Um, former Mr. Kelly used to own the property. It was a vast forest of conservation land then. Water would come fall, winter, spring, and dry up every year. Well, the property has changed owners, and uh, not you know has been he passed away, and uh, it's been used quite differently. Um, a lot of the trees have been removed. I would question some of the tree removal. Possibly should be checked out before anything is done. Might have been pushed into the, some areas. Maybe it shouldn't have been done. He's had bucket trucks, bulldozers, excavators, plows back there over the last five years. Um, and what I've seen now is constant water. I, I took these pictures actually of the planning board. I don't know if I can turn a set of these into you. Um, this is wintertime, ice and water. That's Ted Hildreth up here. That was a few years ago. That's springtime, behind my house, next to my house, all this area. I, I could, could I see that? And obviously you... summer. They come out awful because I printed them, so I can't see the colors well. I have on my phone. Um, so there's water, standing water there that I never used to see, pretty much year-round. And I hear peepers like you wouldn't believe. I've seen the, the eggs in the water. 
My daughters used to catch the salamanders back there. I, I consider them, we've always considered them vernal pools. I mean, we don't have any documentation of that, but they act like vernal pools. And there's water there. I mean, of course, it's even more, but last year when it was dry, when we had that dry year, there was still water there. Mm. And that was never happening. I think it's just changes that have happened to that land already, and those were minor compared to what they want to do now. So I'm just really concerned what's going to happen to my, my land. I hear this earlier, the, the neighborhood earlier with floods. And I, you know, when they change these two lots and take away the, the, the bare, this, hundred, this 50 to 50 to 100 foot area, wipe that out, put a septic in there, that's going to come right into my backyard. You know, that's my concern, mm -hmm. along okay. with all the other great concerns of the neighborhood. Um, as far as you know, the conservation, I know there's an aqua for or uh, in there we're worried about. So, thank you for your time. Like I said, they aren't the best quality pictures, just gives you an idea of what I you know, I see. Well, That's just my observation. Were they taken this year? So, well, the ones that say summer this year, the ones that say winter were probably a year or two last year. Oh, they've been over the last two or three years since, well, when you guys started coming out when this was initially looked at. I started taking some pictures. People said these pools aren't year round. I'm saying, yes, yes, they are. You can see ice in some of those. Um, I think that was the dry summer, the dry winter. We didn't get any snow, there was ice. Mm -hmm. Those were still there. So, um, yeah, my notes say we were there January 2021. So it's two plus years. Yeah, but I, th I think whenever. when those, those ice pictures, we can see a little bit of ice. We didn't really have snow. Was it last year or something? Yeah. Right. But that's still water, yep. <laughs> you know? And like I said, I look up. To, Hill, to 10 Hilda Street for my backyard. Um, I'm not an engineer, I'm not any of this, I'm a you know, retired firefighter, nurse, you know, but common sense says water runs downhill. I don't care what you put there, you know. That's all. So thank thank you. you for your time. Thank you very much. Come on forward. Hi, my name is Justin Johnson. I own 26 Hilda Street. Uh, I'm the abutter to 10 Hilda Street. Um, my concerns, uh, I'll be quick about them, are just from a common sense standpoint, we just talked about, you know, water runs downhill. And we were also talking earlier about the water issues at, um, up in North Chelmsford. And it doesn't make sense to me that we're going to be, we already have flooding in this area, and it doesn't make sense to me that we're going to be putting septic tanks in this area there's no way to guarantee that any of this is foolproof um it just sounds like a recipe for disaster it goes into a aquifer that i believe is part of our drinking water common sense again says that's you're going to put human waste next to a floodplain that then leads directly to an aquifer that we drink water out of and then on top of that, you have to take into the consideration that people are going to be plowing these streets, whether it's a private or a public road, where's the snow going to go? And where's all the treated snow going to end up? It's going to end up in that aquifer. And if you look at like other areas in Massachusetts, where the reservoirs are, they have signs up as you drive by saying no, no salt. Uh, low salt area stuff like that because it's really expensive according to the Massachusetts government site to get these materials out of drinking water and it sounds like we're getting ready to put that problem right on top of our drinking water I don't see how that makes any sense that at all I think that's kind of crazy and then that's not including things like people using chemicals in their lawns which you cannot say to a homeowner don't treat your lawn with something. Uh, don't put pesticides, herbicides, insecticides down. Again, it will leach directly into our water. Um, and on top of that, you also, it, you can put any type of pre-treatment thing in there you want. It's not a guarantee that it'll stop it. Things fail. And it was mentioned earlier that we, somebody made the comment that we seem to be having a 500 year event <coughs> once, once a week now. There's standing water back there. My family's been there for 30 years. In some of the areas that are being proposed to have these developments on, as a joke one year, we actually took a canoe and rode through there. So it's not just a couple inches of water, it's multiple feet um, that flow down through this, that flow down through this ecosystem that's there. 
Um, I do not see how this is, is possible. And I'm not against development or anything like that. I understand there are areas of this property that can be developed, but these, this area back there is, I, I, it's a recipe for disaster if you put things there. Um, it might not happen today, tomorrow, might be five, 10 years from now, but something will inevitably happen like it always does. It's not, it's not, you can't possibly guarantee that it won't. Thank you. Right. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Hello, Ruth. Um, I'm going to try to summarize the letters I sent. Ruth Luna, 10 Carter Drive. So Ruth, Ruth sent us a letter today about this. Two. Oh, one two? just before the hearing, I, like oh, the last okay. second running out I the door. I haven't seen that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Yes, so the first one would go along with what David was saying as far as uh, um, the need for a wildlife habitat assessment. And um, as I think most of you know, I'm the person who held the scientific collecting permit to identify the wood turtle and the Blanding's turtle that use this length of brook. And um, with two other people, then we um, were tra radio tracking um, the turtles for many years. And so we are, are familiar, and, and yes, we did have radio turtles coming down to this length of brook, um, and uh, one of them who seemed to like it. Um, so I, um, I wanted to, I, I had read through the applicant's um, NOI, the, the summary going with it, and I found that it was a bit confusing, their reference to the wildlife habitat assessment. They seemed to be conflating the, um, the wetland regs with the local bylaw, and and not keeping that straight. So I just wanted to just clarify that under the, the state, the state, the, um, it would be a floodplain question, but there, there's a threshold that it's only in the 10-year plain or where buffer zone is in BLSF or where there's vernal pool habitat. And then you have to hit a threshold of 5,000 5, square feet or 10% in that. So it's not automatically all of the BLSF, but any standard or any, any presumption is rebuttable. And I think the fact that the whole site, or almost the whole site up to the house, is um, mapped habitat, I think, is a way of rebutting that presumption that, yeah, the area does provide. And in the letter I sent you earlier today, that one, in there I do list some of the range of overall species that we, we see here, that we've seen along the Brook Corridor. Um, that thing you wouldn't realize are there, just living there, but going out there and actually looking, it is amazing. Um, and so uh, there's, there's the, the Natural Heritage Review, which is under 1059 as far as the rare species. And then what David is talking about, if you're talking from the Act, is from 1060. But then as David points out, yes, the bylaw actually will give you even more opportunity because there you spell out that there is no threshold amount that any resource area with no threshold limit requirement is a reason that you could initiate a wildlife habitat study. So that right there opens that out. And then also in your bylaw, buffer zone is a resource area. And so that also includes that then. Um, and I definitely recommend, rather than having somebody peer review a written report to have them actually go out in the field because I saw firsthand the difference of uh, what a report that came in and at the same time I was out there doing field work and it was a day and night difference of what was getting submitted to Heritage. Um, and so I, I would really encourage you that you take that advantage from your bylaw where you can have the applicant pay for someone who is now working for you so that you can direct that and um, and that I, I would understand wanting to know more what's there and the, the question of wanting to do something come spring um, and then yeah nesting season if you want to do that is um, typically for these would be like like maybe the very very end of May through most of June would be when they're nesting and then hatching out would be um, like mid-August or so. Um, so I just wanted to, to address that, but that I, I would completely agree with having a wildlife habitat assessment, doing it, uh, including under the bylaw, and, um, and, and having the person be someone, it's not just a peer review of what they've done, but doing something fresh to make sure 
that things are not being missed. Um, and then I thought David raised a good point to just double check is that one um, BVW area, is there in fact an area there that is confined that might actually constitute a vernal pool as well. Um, but then the one I sent at the last minute, I just was just starting to review as far as stormwater and things like that. And um, so I, but initially, I may, maybe I looked too quickly, but I did not see on the plans where they're showing the, where the mapped habitat is. I think that should be indicated on the plan. It, 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 they did give it to me. Oh, okay, so the version I was looking at didn't have it's, it. It's this line right here. Okay, and it's, I couldn't find limit of work. Well, I think it's the, the proposed tree line, which again, it's this, it's hard to see, but it's a squiggly. Is that right, okay. Brian? This, this squiggly here. Um, and then um, the compensatory flood storage I realize that they're only one foot contours and so they're they're saying that from 109 feet one and one third inches they're filling but then they're only showing for a 110 contour and I think the fact that you're having to show below 110, having to provide that, if there would be some way that the plan indicates that you're needing to provide below 110, that it would make that clear, whether you believe someone can be that precise to be one, 109, one inch and a third rather than 109. Um, and then um, I, I didn't see with either the filing here or for the planning board, the soil test logs um, for any of the test pits that have been done. And I, I think that those should be submitted as well so you can see what it is more specifically rather than just a summary of the data on the site plan. Um, I didn't see anywhere where snow storage is indicated on the plan and you need to make sure that snow storage is not in the detention basin or draining toward the, I mean the infiltration basin or draining toward it. So those, that needs to be indicated on there. Um, it wasn't, the applicant said it's not a critical area, which we know it is, it's a zone two, but they did then say that basically the, what they need to meet on standards four and six would still qualify. Um, the infiltration basin, as I've pointed out before in other applications, you need to have a minimum of three test pits. There's only one test pit that's been done in that, and test pit, this should be done before your design. That's very clearly spelled out in DEP's stormwater handbook. Um, and I would suggest that it be done to the um, western side where the, the, t the elevation is are in the existing condition is higher so you get a sense of what the seasonal high groundwater might be there. Um, and then there were some things as far as just checking in the stormwater handbook that there should be a monitoring well, there should be access area around the top of the infiltration area, which there isn't unless because there's a house that's too, that would be too close. I didn't find any place where there was a foot of freeboard. Um, and then the O&M plan I felt was lacking compared to what is called for specifically within the um, stormwater handbook. And so these are all things that I think you would want to see. And, and for me, they all became things of this is why I would want somebody working directly for you so you can make sure that things are thorough on a wildlife habitat thing. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, David, can, can I just ask that you make sure that um, David gets um, the two letters that Ruth sent, that the applicant gets the, oh, okay. the, sure. the, yes. the two letters? Yeah. We appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I think it was two letters, That's right, Ruth? Yeah, okay. Sure. Yeah, so just make sure they get it's copies of it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, thanks. Okay, next. this? Hi, I'm Christy Wood. I live at 16 Hildreth Street, um, same as Paul that was up here earlier. Um, just a couple of things that I wanted to mention. One was that, um, I, I forgot your name. Oh, David, sorry. David yep. from Hancock had mentioned, um, you know, I just want to reiterate, like, he had said that they did their own, they're going to do their own wildlife study, and I know that you've said, Dave had said that, you know, he would like to do one as well. And I know Ruth kind of reiterated that point. I d also want to reiterate that point because, I mean, I know this is obvious, but um, who is he working for? And so, you know, we want to make sure that this is not biased or kind of a, con a conflict of interest, per se, you know, p perhaps. Um, so I do think that there are 
there is a lot of potential for there to be um, findings of wildlife there. I, I, I agree with Ruth. Um, I have seen it myself. We have coyotes. We have, um, what are those turtles that we saw the other day? Snapping turtles, Snapping turtles walking watched, across the street, hatch hatching out, out right hatching the out, they do it coming out. Year, they come across yep. my yard right from the um, yep. wetland area. So <laughs> right. they're there every spring. Deer. They come. Deer. Deer, Deer. Deer turkeys, bobcats, foxes. Bob 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 yep, all that. And where are they going to go? They're already encroaching in. We hear them every night. We hear the coyotes every night. Where are they going to go? They're losing all their, all their spaces. Um, nobody seems to care about that. I care about it very much. And I wanted to say, too, that, okay, moving the wetlands, are you really moving the wetlands, or are you just making a hole? Are you going to be out there and taking the wildlife and the plants and planting them and creating an ecosystem, or are you just digging a hole that's going to fill in with water? So that's really not a correct term, is it? So I just hope that you take all those things into account when you make your decision or, well, not make your decision, but when you give your, your feedback to the um, planning board, please. Yep. All right. Let's preserve Chelmsford. All right. Thank you. Thank you for your input. I'm Linda Carney, and I live at 17 Hilda Street and 19 Plum Street. We own the corner lot adjacent directly across from the property. and. Ruth is a really hard act for me to follow because my presentation was all going to be based on the fact that this land is 100% seeded on our aquifer that feeds into both Mill and River Neck Road, Mills, River Neck, the wells there, and feeds most of the drinking water to the whole town. And out of that 100% of the property, 50% of it is known as a high aquifer. It's either high aquifer, wetlands, buffer zone, or actual wetlands. And I think they might have misrepresented earlier, I misunderstood. They said that they weren't going to be building in a wetland zone, and one of the lots does include wetland area, actual wetlands. So I'm very concerned about everything everybody else has said, but I think most important is that we need to protect that aquifer for the town of Chelmsford. And, um, you know, it's, it's kind of riddled with a lot of misinformation. The applicant that they just said that they were working on behalf is not the owner of the property. So but they need to get their ducks in a row. There's the three different owners, three different places. But it's a single individual that owns that property now. It's not in the name of a trust. So I wanted to clarify that or request that you get it clarified because I know who owns the property. We've seen the deed. So I'm sure we'll be back. I appreciate your constant conservation <laughs> efforts on behalf of the town of Chelmsford, and we just need to take into account what we're doing to the aquifer. Thank you. Thank you for your input. I didn't memorize everything real well. I just remembered that um, the, the infiltration bed also was supposed to have a 50-foot setback from leach fields, and it um, is within 50 feet of two of the leach fields so um, that should be addressed and I know it's not in your jurisdiction but if I were sitting on your side I would want to know where the reserve leach fields would be getting located as well just to know what what that potential impact is so I just wanted to add those Thank you. Good evening. My name is Bob Goth here. I'm at 22 Hildred Street. And I hope this relates to you people. If not, somebody should know about it. Uh, the prior tenant, now owner of the property, uh, did a major car repair business at night on the property. Somebody mentioned earlier that a couple of cars have been buried out there, a couple of cars out there still. Uh, I'm concerned about hazardous waste. Whose jurisdiction is, jurisdiction is that? Is that your jurisdiction or who? Because I want to see that if there's any hazardous waste out there that's been remediated. That's a good question. I guess. I'm, I'm sorry, there's an air conditioner in my ear. My yes. Ear. Uh, you were referring to some automobile or truck repair work? Yes. Yeah. All of the above. Yeah. Okay. All 
All right, and just not regular motor vehicles. I mean, construction vehicles, vehicles, this, that, and the other thing. And and you've observed actual repair work or just storage? Please, anybody neighborhood wise. Yes. Okay. And I've received mail to my home that was misdirected, directed to that address, and we put in their mailbox to Midnight Mechanics, and it was billing. Okay. Okay. So is, is that your jurisdiction to? Well, if you were here at the beginning, we, we, we were talking about at the very beginning about how there's multiple people or multiple uh, boards, commissions, water districts right. that have jurisdiction, uh, but we do have uh, interest there. Okay, sure. and is that something you would uh, ask Hancock to look for and come to some solution do that. with? We can do that. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, uh, I think we're ready to go to continue. Move to yes, continue. I think so. So um, I think in, I think in terms of next steps, yeah, well, I'll, I'll coordinate with the DPW on where they are with the stormwater review. Um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll forward them Ruth's letter as well. They may already be looking at the concerns she raised. Um, so and, and and I will also I've, I've I've also cleared it with the applicants representative that there's no they have no conflict with Oxbow Associates who would would be peer reviewing or doing their own wildlife study. Um, I'll uh, I'll call them and discuss this an appropriate scope of work with them. Um, and uh, then I also do need the funding for the uh, the review of the. LSA performance standards. So, um, okay, it looks like we have one more person who wants to step Thank up. Thank you. I'm Jeff Carney. I live at 17 Hildreth Street. And I'm just wondering about uh, the trees that have been cut down in the last year or two. There are a lot of large hardwood trees that were not supposed to be cut down. I was wondering who's going to replace them and if they're going to be replaced. We well, can look at that, yeah, David. Well, yeah. For, first of all, um, that if, if in fact there were a lot of trees removed, that should have been authorized by Natural Heritage because again, that's that is most of that is rare species habitat, and that's the kind of activity that they were supposed to authorize. Authorize um, now, uh, whether or not whether or not they would, if, if if that were proven to them, I don't know whether or not they would they would take any enforcement action. Um, I, I, I don't know. Um, I can't speak for them, but I think that that's something that we could also ask our wildlife peer reviewer to, to research as well, to go back and uh, look at aerial photos, photographs from the last few years, mm -hmm. try and establish whether whether or not that in fact there had been large scale tree clearing on the property. Would they have to be replaced? Um, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I, that that again, that would be I think uh, natural heritage taking some kind of enforcement action, and and and, and again, I, I I don't know what um, what they would do. Uh, certainly, in the conservation commission's jurisdiction, I think that that the commission would have the authority to require that, um, like in the in, in the wetlands and buffer zone, and you know, like the uh, the flood zone. So the commission couldn't do that. Yes. Thank you. Paul Wood, 16 Hello Street. Just want to make a comment. Jeff, remind me. Um, back behind the, the existing house, there's a horse, horse barn. It was built long before we were there. He took an excavator, smashed it down, and rebuilt a new one there. Well, I know probably without any permits, I'm sure. But I don't know if that was in that zone and if that was ever even legal. Also, that might be something the Conservation Commission wants to look at. Is her saying that that's out there now? Oh, well, yeah. Yeah, so along with the racetrack, when they used to do the racetrack with all the, the stuff and so, material. So, so how large a structure is this? You can probably you can see it. It was a it used to be a, a horse barn. Mr. Kelly had for two horse stalls and a, and a corral, but it, I know why he had the excavator in there now because he smashed it down. Who knows if he did do the debris? And then he built a new one. I don't think it's on the same side. It looks deeper in to me. I don't go back there because I don't dare go on his property. I don't want to deal with that stuff, you know. So is, is, is that is that shown on the plan? That structure where yeah. where it pointed out. That's right here. Oh, okay. 
Was there any permits pulled for that, do you know? Because it's a brand new structure in the last two years. Uh, I can check. Yeah, I'll check on that. All right. That's okay. All. Thank you. Thank you. So we um, move to continue, I think. We're at that point. I move to continue to our next meeting of September 26th. Is that appropriate date? I think we can we can get some answers back okay. by then. Yeah. Okay. So Chris makes the motion to continue the hearing to the next meeting on the twenty sixth. Any second? Second. Bill. Any uh, all, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? None. Okay. So we will continue until September twenty sixth. <coughs> two weeks from tonight. Thanks. Thank you. All. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your comments. Are these two people. Are these continue to. Uh, Lumbo and I just was here. Yeah. I don't know if he's still here. The other one's continued. All right. So we're almost done. I go to the bathroom. Yeah, break time? Yeah, yeah. Why, don't we, why don't we take a three minute break? Yeah. Oh, come on. Come on. That's not five, right. five minute break. <laughs> That's not time to get to the pub and back. <laughs> Can we they still get, run? Get a, hit, the, hit the men's room.
Is, is Vivian coming back? Yes. <laughs> She's gone down to the basement, so it might take a couple minutes. You don't want to offer to do her job? <laughs> um, no. Let's see. <laughs> we could start, right? I think we can start with her. Look at all these. Well, why, why, don't, why don't we why don't wait? We wait on that? Yeah. Am I correct that the next two are both continued? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Good. Yeah, we're, we're gonna because Bruce gonna, left. Bruce clearly isn't here, so right. You, you will we'll move quickly through the rest. Yeah, the rest you of it. Know, we're I, almost I there. It's all downhill now. Oh. <laughs> Metaphorically it's speaking, all downhill. <laughs> yeah. Metaphorically, For all of us. Yeah. <laughs> it's been uphill till now. <laughs> that first one was a lot more. Involved than I thought it was going to get. I, I, oh, yeah. I have to put I have to put David on the spot. We talked yesterday, and he said, "Oh, this shouldn't be a big deal." <laughs> uh -oh. Well, that was before <laughs> all hell broke loose last night with yes. the rain. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, it's wild. Yeah. I mean, I went out there today. That was yeah, pretty ugly. I, out there. I went out there. It was yeah. very are, wet. Are, are are we still live? Probably. Yeah, like are we live? Yeah, I think we are. Yeah, yeah we're live. <laughs> oh, I was going to say, uh, Dave Sperry, thanks, hey. Dave Sperry. I was, I was just going to make the comment that whole hundred year flood and what is it is just upending Changing. the whole industry. Yeah. I know, because we've seen it like every two weeks. Yeah. They, they have to reset that standard. Well, it has been reset by Mass Highway DOT a couple of years ago, but the number they picked, yeah, it's, it's worse so. than the number they picked. And the wetlands people are still working on it. Okay, let's let's keep moving here. So next on the agenda, notice of intent of uh, which was continued from August twenty second, Chelmsford Lumber, two hundred one two hundred three Boston Road, and David, we are. It w that's yeah. There's been a request for a continuance pending uh, peer review on that. Oh, that's right. Still, that still, that one's still on still peer still review. Work, work, working on getting a proposal. For that that's CEI doing that uh, they, they, they have they have submitted a proposal that the uh, the applicant is questioned okay so that's right. hopefully, okay. hopefully we can get this resolved okay all right so maybe it won't even be at the next one if they haven't it, it, done it, it, it may not be especially if we end up getting a new peer reviewer but okay okay so I'll take a motion to continue to August uh, September 26th is so, moved. So, moved. so moved by Chris. Second. Second, Second by Bill. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, none. So that one's continued. Next one is the request for amended order of conditions 129.0931. Uh, continued from our last meeting. This is 270 Bill Ricker Road. Um, and uh, this is also being requested <coughs> for Yes, pending, pen, pending completion <coughs> of peer review. Now, um, I, uh, I have emphasized to Beta that, you know, we, we need, I mean, there, there are two letters that we're getting. One, one is for stormwater, one is for the calling environmental, which deals with the contamination issues. So I, I have emphasized to Beta that we need those letters, you know, in, in, in a timely manner such that I and the commission and interested parties have the enough time to review the letters and and uh, draft responses, you know, before the next meeting on the 26th. So I think he and understands that. They understand that. Yeah, they yeah, acknowledge so, that. Okay. So, so I, I I would expect them to have them within a week. Okay. We'll see. All right. So we should be looking for that in our mail uh, yes. in the next week or so. Um, to be seeing that and try to review that. And I know, Peter, you've been looking for that in specific, <coughs> but we all are. Okay, so I'd take a motion to continue the uh, hearing for 270 Bill Ricker Road uh, to the next meeting of September 26th. So moved. So moved by Chris, second, second by Mark. All in favor, aye. aye. Opposed, none. Okay, so approved to move to the 26th. We can move on to the next uh, close. That's the end of the regulatory section. Now we can go to continue business. So, zero Littleton Road. Yes. <laughs> so, um, I mean, Carl and I were out there yesterday. Um, he, 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 I'd say he has made some progress in restoring the disturbed area. Um, that, that's certainly true. You know, the, the, uh, the buffer zone, there's been some planting there. 
Um, he still hasn't mapped the wetland uh, flags to a plan. Um, I did. I did send him um, uh, yesterday. I sent him um, a, a, another contact or contact at, a, at another company, surveying company. He, he he replied to me today saying he's reached out to them. So hopefully that will get done and then and then get that RDA filed as required by the enforcement order. Okay. Uh, Quick question. Yes. Is the surveyor community? so busy that it's difficult to get a surveyor it it, it, going it, on it, it has time. been yeah yeah it's 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 there's there's been a huge backlog Just with surveyors yeah. my, my 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 sense is is that things are beginning to slow down a little bit and in, in fact the name i sent him was from a company that recently told me specifically that things have slowed down for them so, okay. so hope, hopefully We'll get something soon on that. And the update on 35 Brick Kiln Road? Um, and not too different. I mean, there I've been waiting for an RDA to be filed. I, I emailed the, the property owner today asking for a status report on that, you know, where things stand with getting the RDA filed. Um, I know that she had reached out to um, a wetland consultant, a wetland scientist to do that. Uh, did not have not heard back from her yet. So. Again, I don't think, I, I mean, in theory, they're not too far away from, again, getting that resolved. Okay. Okay. Um, anything else on your, uh, nothing else listed here, but. No, I don't have any. Okay. On the land management on Warren Pole, um, we're making progress on the CR and the MOU. The MOU is, um, we're having some discussions with the, um, uh, town council, um, Chris Alfin uh, works for the town council on how to approach that. So we're, we're still making progress there. Um, the sign. So, Bill, you want to give us an update? The sign. Did you get the email I sent? Yeah, I saw it. The okay. sign is Can done. You, that's a beautiful sign. <laughs> Can you put the picture up? Um, yeah, hold on. <laughs> you solved the sign problem. You got the sign. This is, uh, so this is the granite sign <coughs> that um, uh, is being done by La Maisserie, La Maisserie, La Maisserie, La Maisserie up in uh, North, Chelmsford. North Chelmsford. And uh, we're almost done. <laughs> well, why does it have your photograph on the sign? <laughs> mm -hmm. Nice. So there it is. Yeah. Nice. Very nice. So the rest of it is uh, the, the uh, Post, they were all done too. Um, I was up there today and I spoke to John and we've got uh, Charlie Wojcic is gonna help us uh, dig the holes. I'm gonna meet up with Charlie and dig the holes. I know the measurements that need to be done and then uh, we'll uh, line up getting, the, getting it installed in the next few weeks. I'm good. So hopefully we can have a, some days. kind of a hot days. <laughs> Next few days. I like to give myself a little leeway. <laughs> Look at that. Chelmsford, then, Chelmsford Granite, too. Look at that Chelmsford Granite. It is Chelmsford, Chelmsford Granite, yeah. 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 Yes. How can you tell? It's got a certain, like, texture and gray. It's, fa oh. it's famous granite. Well, oh, obviously, right. you don't live in Chelmsford, Dave. No. <laughs> you know that. I, I never would have guessed <laughs> it's, it's Chelmsford it's Granite. It's very famous. So thank you, Bill, for yeah. chasing this down. We're not done yet. We're almost <laughs> over the over the goal line, but yeah. this is really they, great to see. They so. did a great job. Yeah. and uh, Oh, it looks great. It's going to be nice. Good. Good. Okay, All right. A little better late than never. <laughs> when we get that, yeah, when we get that up, then we will have a uh, an opening uh, event uh, uh yeah, I'm very sad that Mrs. Pohl didn't make it for that. But, uh, yeah, that's too bad. Yeah. Uh, but um, but this will be this will be good. This will be good. That might help uh, cheer people up there at that at that family. So, um, Crooked Spring is the other thing I wanted to bring up on land management. Um, so Crooked Spring, um, you know, I, we talked about it at the last meeting about the Beaver Dam that's up on the Graniteville end, and it's swamping the the uh, the the. The walkway bridge that's at the Graniteville end, and um, you know, my my thought is that the in the long term that having you know taking that the walkway out and building a, a much more bigger, not cheap, but um, <laughs> a, a bigger bridge that goes from upland to upland essentially would be the right long term plan. 
Um, meanwhile, uh, the culvert that's there, um, David has talked with, um, why don't you just summarize what you had in your conversations with Courtney? Uh, I think it was Courtney. Uh, 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 yes. Um, so uh, I guess uh, uh, Stormwater has some concerns um, about uh, their culvert up there and uh, and the the impact the potential impact to it from the be the beaver dam um so uh you know i i think uh i i offered to meet up there with with um her and storm new stormwater superintendent i think carl you mentioned you'd be interested in going so um we'll, we'll take a look at that she she said she said that that there are components of the current bridge that are that are actually part of the dam now. I guess somehow the I don't quite understand, but some you're saying somehow the beaver, the beavers have incorporated it integrated into, the the bridge into the dam. Uh, or, yeah, yeah, yeah. Would, and, I, and and she's worried if 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 the dam gives way, which I think is highly unlikely. Beaver dams don't generally give way unless unless they're meddled with by people. Um, that they're, they're worried that. That's it'll, I guess it'll take the bridge with it. Uh, I'll, we'll, we'll just have to see, yeah, okay. you know, right. what they're concerned with. So meanwhile, as you and I were talking about this yesterday, I got a message from our friend here on the uh, on the on the screen here, Mr. Sperry, and he uh, or was that today even? Maybe that was even today. Uh, you're on mute, Dave. I think, but um, Dave brought up the concern, which I think is a really good concern that. When you look on Graniteville Road, up and down Graniteville Road on either side of the Crooked Spring um, dip, let's call it, um, that for years the street silt has been going into that brook, and you know through the through the um, the, the grates, the you know the storm water, and the brook itself has, I, I don't I don't know the history exactly, Dave, but maybe it's something you know the the silt has been filling in, and this this the the depth of the brook is a lot less it's more shallow uh, yeah it used to be about two feet deep uh, going underneath the bridge okay so I think what makes sense is you know we've had good discussions in the past about those um, culverts with <coughs> in fact not long ago maybe uh, May May or June with um, I think with Trevor or, or um, yes. Yes. Tony or I forget who and so I know that they have this on their radar um, and I think we need to look at uh, again sort of like the Dunshire Drive situation uh, is looking at this a little more holistically than than just um, uh, you know I, I think there's a combination of invasive uh, ja uh, the um, uh, not weed. Japanese knotweed there which is really bad combined with the beaver dam combined with um, this uh, culvert thing that there's an awful lot that we ought to <coughs> put together a comprehensive plan for that end of the site. On top of the other end of the site, um, the um, where the outlet of Crooked Spring Brook goes under Crooked Spring Road, this is right around the corner from Mr. Garahan's house, yeah. um, and I know he knows this well, um, that was, I, I'm going to guess last night it was underwater. Um, cause Wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, it the, was. The road I, I was tried, underwater? The road I tried was, uh, driving through that last night, and yeah. I thought my car, my SUV was going to flow through it. Yeah, so that one, I think, That's should crazy. almost be the first, you know, going back to our first meeting tonight, um, maybe we fix the, the bottom end before we fix the top end and make sure that things flow out and we don't just create a problem. But... Um, the bottom end, when you stand there and look on, there's a bridge. There's a bridge that was put in by an Eagle Scout about two years ago. And if you stand on that bridge and look at that culvert and you think about the amount of rain we got last night, you go, that is absolutely not sized right. There's no way that, that, that that's the right thing. So I think there's an opportunity for that being high up on the list with DPW. So that site has a lot of opportunity too. So Dave, is there anything else you would want to throw in? No, but it's just that uh, that area, the, the top end has been silting in for quite a while. Yeah. Uh, and it would be nice to restore it to the, the way it was. So if you don't know Dave, he's one of our stewards. He's been a volunteer on a lot of sites, a lot of different places. Um, also, you're on the sustainability committee, I believe. Uh, or you work? I'm there also, and I'm also on the land trust. Land trust, yeah. So, and he walks Cricket Spring quite regularly, so he knows it very, very well. So, anyway. I, I think the sand is going to, is a lot le better than it was since the town isn't using sand anymore. 
on their that ropes. Could be, that could be, yeah. Uh, yeah. But and it's a lot catch, watch. It's cleaning out catch basins now where they weren't doing yeah. it. Yeah, that's a good point. That's true. Yeah. That's probably mitigated it from uh, the way it was going for years. It still exists, but it's, I don't think it's going to get much worse. Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, I think that's it. We The only thing left is we have minutes. And um, I... I, would, I, I hate to put it off, but I'm, it's awfully late, and I'd rather we don't do this right now. Um, again, knowing that some of these are important, uh, unless everybody's good with them. Um, I don't want to be read, reading them right now. Okay. And Dave's sure. not here, too, and I know he had some comments. So if it's okay, we'll put it off. Um, maybe we'll do that early in the meeting in case Dave has to leave early again. We might want to do that because I do want to get the minutes reviewed and approved. But um, um, I hate pushing it off a little bit longer, but um, it's just awfully late. Yeah, you're right. I, I think it's good. Where did the time go? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. What, what were we doing? Okay. Any, anything else? I take a motion to adjourn we'll the meeting. Adjourn. Meeting adjourned. Second. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, aye. no. We're, all, we're adjourned. Thank you very much. Okay. okay.